imagine me and you and you and me together eating golden grams so happily that crispy gram and honey toast was meant to be so happy together love that golden honey and gram cracker taste of golden grams it's a part of your complete breakfast of those golden Want to see some pudding? How can it be? I can't believe my eyes. New pudding roll-ups, pudding in disguise. They give me lots of things. Pudding can't be but the yummy, yummy taste. That's pudding to me. New Betty Crocker pudding roll-ups in milk chocolate, chocolate fudge, or butterscotch. Real pudding in disguise. New pudding roll-ups. Am I surprised? Pudding roll-ups. Pudding in disguise. New pudding roll-ups. I wish ice cream. It's easy. We're Wish World Kids. Treats and sweets opens up to more. Wish your fridge into an ice cream store. Oh. Shelby serves her favorite treat. Scoops up sundaes that are neat. Wish World Kids. Read and speed becomes a car now. Jesse can Ooh. drive for an ice cream bar. Great. When you wish for one, you get twice the fun. <laughs> wish World Kids. Each place sets sold separately. Treats and sweets and read and speed come with their very own dolls. Wish World Kids from Kenner. It was a dusty day when the rabbit strolled in looking for tricks. This disguise will get me some tricks. A rootin' tootin' part of this here complete breakfast. Hi, stranger. Pull up the bowl. Finally, truly terrific, totally tasty, tootie fruity tricks. Hey, kid. Yep. Don't I know you? Nope. Okay, kid, then what's your name? <laughs> name? He needs a name to get tricks. If you help name him, you'll get four free markers. Mail in forms on boxes of tricks. Why does Kellogg's Raisin Bran taste so good? He's got two scoops of raisins. How many is that? Enough to give one raisin to all of Dad's bowling team, Whoa. the flight crew of a 747, and all the Miss Universe contestants. Wow, two scoops is a lot. There's still enough raisins for an entire Navy Frogman unit. That's a crowd of raisins. And you know what? Yeah, they're all for us. Kellogg's Raisin Bran, a delicious part of this complete breakfast. There's a crowd of raisins in two scoops. I gotta feel the taste, gotta taste the pop, it blows me away. I wanna pop it on my mouth, gotta get hot. Pop the crisp and light, pop in every bite. Kellogg's Corn Pops, the great tasting part of this nutritious breakfast that'll give you a good pop in the mouth. Wanna pop in the mouth? Gotta get pop. And now this message. Come on, baby, on the set, please. They came from fruit to show the world two fruits are more fun than one. New Sunkiss Tutti Fruits, the first fruit snack made with two kinds of fruit. Two, 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 two. Tutti Fruit, Tutti Fruit. Chewy on the outside, salt on the inside. Two Tutti Fruits, wow. New Sunkiss Tutti Fruits, because two fruits are more fun than one. Tutti Fruits, Tutti Fruits. <laughs> Oh, here comes crispy critters, a good wholesome bunch. The low sugar cereal with lots of crunch. It's indubitably. 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 Most crispy critter cereal is part of a balanced breakfast. And now a special offer. It's a puzzle and a storybook. Free in specially marked boxes of crispy critter cereal. But grimy. Mm -mm. My super golden crisp cereal with eight vitamins makes this nutritious breakfast really neat. I just love that sweet crispy wheat. Well, ho, ho, ho. What's up, Croc? Uh, don't be bashful with that box, sugar bear. Put the coal in the bowl. Time for a vitamin pack punch. I guess he bit off more than he could chew. I can't get enough of super golden crisp. It's got the crunch with punch. Yeah. Tasty new, 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 new,
Kellogg's Rice Krispies, the part of this complete breakfast that goes... Kellogg's Rice Krispies. Have you heard how good they are? Hamburger University with Ronald McDonald. Good morning, class. Good, good morning, morning, Ronald. Today's subject, the Hamburglar. Ooh. The Hamburglar is very clever and very sneaky. The Hamburglar! And he loves taking McDonald's hamburgers. So, what should you yell when you see it? Help Ronald Taylor! That's right. Uh-oh. Hamburglar. You've got a lot to learn. Don't take burgers, Rubble Rubble. Oh, McDonald's! Whoa! We've got Lucky Corner! We'll get his Lucky Charms this time. Not so fast, me friends. I make an ice cave and hide in the old reflections with the Lucky Charms. The marshmallowy part of this nutritious breakfast. With pink hearts, orange stars, yellow moons, green clovers, blue diamonds, and purple horseshoes. Yikes, I'm trapped in ice and freezing. Lucky needs help. But how can we find the real Lucky? Those kids can't. But you kids at home can when you watch this commercial on TV with these magic glasses. Free in specially marked boxes of Lucky Charms. And with them, you can find the real Lucky magically on TV. Wow. I can see you. Can you find the real Lucky, too? You can with your magic glasses in Lucky Charms. Surprise! Hey, what are you doing in my medicine cabinet? I'm the Pump Man, Aquafresh for kids. The toothpaste made specially for kids. My very own toothpaste? Right, I make brushing fun. I've got a zingy taste <laughs> kids love. Fluoride, too. And I'm easy to pump and wow. have a neat top. Hey, Pump Man, hide. Here comes my mom. Aquafresh for kids. I make brushing fun. And now, these messages. All right, remember, stick to the game plan. Right. Point one, they come to you. Point two, never look hungry. Oh, they're so big on chocolate. Yeah, chocolate after here. Let's not forget point three. What's that? No one points one and two aren't working. It's hard to keep them on the rest of the Hi, I'm John Madden. This is what they call a promo. I've got less than 30 seconds to tell you about my Super Bowl special. We'll analyze the game from every angle. We'll take a look at the coaches, the quarterbacks, the guys in the trenches, even those linebackers with the goofy eyes. So you can watch my Super Bowl special right here. But hey, Somebody's got to tell you when it's on. Watch John Madden's Super Bowl special tonight at 9, only on 7. <laughs> Follow our Broncos to the Super Bowl with the 7 sports team. Wake up to the hot taste of Kellogg's Hot Tarts. So hot, they're cool. Fillings give Pop Tarts an incredible taste. So hot, they're cool. Pee Wee will return after these messages. The honeycomb hideout. It's Big Brad Mo, the motorcycle maniac. Yeah, I want a big cereal with a big taste. It's not small. No, no, no. 
Oh my God, two streams, one night? Man, I don't know how long this stream is going to be, but uh, I don't know. I promised you guys some plevin, and uh, where you hit the three-hour mark earlier, and then Turtle Boy went live, and then I figured, all right, well, uh, I know a lot of you guys aren't going to want to miss the plevin stuff, so I figured I'd save it for another time. And then tomorrow isn't looking great for doing a live stream uh so i figured i'd just knock it out tonight um i don't know if i'm gonna go in a another three hours but uh we're we'll definitely do a little little plevin review um <laughs> uh yeah so uh i'm 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 on my third pot of coffee folks yeah that's happening so we got at least as long as this pot of coffee lasts me. All right. But uh, <laughs> it's good to see you guys again. Thanks for joining me a second time. Thanks for not being totally sick of me. Uh, <laughs> and I hope you all had a uh, ha had an excellent St. Patrick's Day. Um, I hope it's still going well for you. Um, no, nah, no Baileys, man. Um Listen, I'm, let me tell you guys about drinking for me, man. I like to drink. Don't get me wrong. I do. Um, but, man, like, I'm getting older, and uh, I'm starting to find the drinking to be kind of arbitrary. Uh, I keep finding myself uh, weighing reasons as to why I shouldn't drink as opposed to why I should when it happens, <laughs> like I'm not in, I, I'm not in like, I'm not in like recovery or anything, you know, I'm not saying I'm never going to drink again, but uh, like drinking, like just because I'm bored is like for the fucking birds, man. And I find myself drinking sometimes just cause I'm fucking bored. Uh, but I haven't done that in a minute, man. It's been a minute. So I, I don't even know. Um, <laughs> uh, it just hasn't it, it hasn't interested me in a, in, in a while, you know. Um, I. Uh, I don't know what it is like, I just uh, every time I think about it, I'm just like, ah, oh, well, you know, and having clubber now has a lot to do with it, too. Um, uh, especially like since clubber just got, you know, he just got fixed and, uh, needed a little extra care and, and, and I'm nervous about being a bad dog dad. You know what I mean? Um, I never owned a dog like outright before where, where, you know, he was fully 100% my responsibility. And, um, so for me, it's, it's just, uh, Kate and I'm with you actually. Um, I did eat, uh, my gummy. <laughs> I did eat one of those, uh, but I just ate it. So it's not going to hit me for like another 20 or 30 minutes. But, um, and I do like to, uh, indulge in, in, in mushrooms from time to time. 
Uh, usually I like to do that about once a month uh, as of late. But um, and normally I'll just put on like a Marvel movie or something. And <laughs> that's what I do. But but um, drinking, man, like my tolerance is so high for it now. Uh, you know, like the only the only satisfaction from drinking I'm going to get is from like whiskey. And it takes so much of it to get me to where I want to feel where I'm at, where I want to feel. And I, I just I can't. Yeah, like, and it's, it's, it's affecting my body, you know, and, and right now, like wanting to be more active and, and going to the gym as much as I do. And, um, there's just, like I said, there's just so many reasons. Like when I think about just the effort of even going to the store to get it, I'm like, oh, do I want to do that? You know what? No, I really don't. And there's been times where I'm bored and I'm just like, yeah, man, you know, Maybe I'll get some whiskey tonight. And then when it comes down to it, I'm like, no. Uh, so, you know, and beer is just fucking pointless. Beer is just just to, to have <laughs> something to just keep drinking. And, and I, it just, like, I, I just, I don't know what it is. I'm just not interested in drinking lately. So, um, but I mean, at any given time, I might just be like, you know what? Fuck it. Uh, but just hasn't lately. So, um, but uh, no, and I like beer. I like beer a lot. You know, I just, you know, I, I just, I don't know. I'm trying to burn fat. Beer's no good for that. Whiskey's no good for that. Uh, trying to gain muscle. Whiskey's no good for that. Um trying to get up and go to the gym regularly like whenever you can whiskey's no good for that <laughs> so um i'm just not yeah i i'm just not interested in it lately you know so but um and like i said like i mean and even today like i thought of it i was like i mean it's saint patty's day you know it's a valid enough excuse and then i'm like well, I'm not Irish, and and who's St. Patrick? Like, what did he do? Oh, I don't even know, so why am I? No, you know? <laughs> no. Uh, so, yeah. Um, man, you know, like, honestly, I'm not even trying to get, like, you know, like, not at all. Um, I'm just trying to, like, uh, just stay fit, feel good. Um, and, uh, you know, add, you know, <laughs> uh, slow down the aging process just a little bit, you know? So, um, so that's it, you know, but, uh, but yeah. Hey, clever. Come here, buddy. People are asking about you. Come here, buddy. Come here. Come on. Come say hi. Come here. Come here. Oh, he's tired. It's late. He's usually asleep by now. It's okay, baby boy. It's okay. He's a sweet boy. And he's got no more cone on his head. No more cone. We took it off earlier today, didn't we? It's a good boy. Yeah, he just went ahead and laid down like right here. So, yeah, he's done for the day. <laughs> uh, I walked the hell out of him today, too. So, he's probably pretty tired. Um, but, uh, yeah, so earlier we talked about, we went over, uh, Twattendoffer's last, uh, video and it's just full of bullshit, you know, as, as usual, it's just full of bullshit. Uh, but I always find it entertaining to go over that bullshit. Um, and so now, uh, we're going to go over Plevin's last video, at least some of it. Um, and uh, uh, I haven't watched any of it yet. Uh, I've only looked at like some of his like tweets. Um, and at least he acknowledged like he said something. Because I, I would imagine that somebody like Plevin, as soon as there's some sort of rift 
between two people who he's been openly criticizing and calling liars, um, he's going to have no choice but to like go the fucking logical route to some degree, at least where he claimed, you know, where he stated that he didn't believe that turtle boy was an informant either. Um, <laughs> thinks he's a federal informant, but so what if he is, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, Good. Let's say Turtle Boy's a federal informant. Good. Is he protected? No. He's not protected because he did two months in jail. Um, two months in jail, which was the maximum of what they could give him for violating his bail. Uh, so um, I, I'm just not seeing the... the <laughs> I'm not seeing anything that indicates to me that Turtle Boy is an informant of any kind, any shape or form whatsoever. Um, I'm just not seeing it. Uh, so, uh, but what's really funny about these folks is, except for Twat and Dopper, like, it's like the walls are closing in on any of their logic. And now, like, like Twat and Dopper, like earlier, was just like, you know, screw it. I'm just going to lie. <laughs> I'm just going to flat out lie and show you the proof of me lying, basically. Like in her video, she's, I mean, it was almost as though she was, it was almost as though she was trying to be slick and systematically walk and say, walk through and walk back what she was saying by trying to say that now, like, oh, you know, like she's setting herself up to be like, oh, I've always said that. No, dude, like the internet's forever. We have screenshots of all your tweets. We have, I mean, you might as well just own the shit. You know, and where are all her videos? Her, her, she barely has any videos, you know? Um, it's just, it's just silly to watch these people now all of a sudden. Now that we know, uh, what the, now, now that we know that, that they failed to put Turtle Boy back in jail, A, B, the federal investigations findings, at least some of them, we know. Uh, we also know that they filed a bunch of motions, that a bunch of motions were filed by the defense uh, that are still impounded, that are impounded. So we don't know what they're up to now. Um, we also know that the um, we also know that the uh, that the um, sorry, I got distracted by chat again as usual. Um, we also know that the, the, that trooper Proctor is now under internal investigation, which I don't, I just don't, uh, I don't invest much in that. Uh, the fact that he's being investigated internally by the very organization that allowed him to, and is still allowing him to operate uh, I just don't trust that investigation. I don't put much into that investigation. If he's being investigated for for conducting his investigations with with either uh, malice to frame someone or just pure uh, oops so many times in one investigation, uh, then he should not be allowed to continue to operate. Uh, there's another investigation that, uh, that, that the integrity of it hangs in the balance that I don't want to see happen that, uh, he's part of, which I believe is the, the, uh, Brian Walsh investigation. And I, I don't want to see, I don't want to see that guy walk free. I, I, I know that guy's guilty. I don't want to see that guy walk free because Proctor fucked up. Um, so I think that the Massachusetts state police needs to be doing everything that they can to preserve the integrity of that particular investigation while they still can. Um, cause this whole, you know, nothing to see here, bullshit that they keep trying to pull just isn't flying. It's just not flying. So, uh, yeah, this shit is just unbelievable. Like I I've never seen anything like this case, uh, I've never seen anything like it. It's fascinating to me. Um, 
Um, but Bigfoot, UFOs, Loch Ness, and who doesn't really want something like that to be true? I mean, let's say we follow an expeditionary team into the forests of the Pacific Northwest. Don't we want them to at least maybe find a big footprint or maybe a recording of a howl? Aren't we intrigued by footage of something weird in the sky that we can't explain? As we become adults, we're forced to recognize. See, here's the problem with aliens and Bigfoot. It's not common knowledge that these things exist. There are people who believe they exist, but you cannot compare that to a conspiracy to cover up a murder amongst law enforcement officers, because that's not something that is unheard of. That has happened, I'm sure, on several occasions in the past. There is definitely such a thing as corruption and mass corruption. There's definitely such a thing as this. It is not far-fetched to 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 suspect this especially in this case if we've seen mass corruption happen before and then we're seeing cop after cop after cop get caught lying and 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 conducting an investigation into the death of another police officer that was found on the property of another police officer um, and that and con that investigation is is conducted in such uh, an irresponsible fashion. It is definitely not far fetched or strange or or absurd to suspect corruption. Not at all. So you you can't compare this case. And the likely, not just possible, but likely conspiracy taking place um, to something like Bigfoot or aliens or the Loch Ness Monster. You just cannot do it. it it's, it's not. Oh, Cherry's back. Thank you, Cherry, for being here. Appreciate it. Um, and guys, uh, got it. I got some new ideas for merch. Uh, this it's one one piece of merch in the works one idea for merch uh that's in the works right now that i i think you guys will enjoy um <laughs> cherry's cherry's in a bad mood cherry is irish and has been drinking all day so i expect some uh some attitude <laughs> um but uh yeah cherry's not human cherry can 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 just drink for days and and function even better than I can. It's amazing. Um, and then not drink for however long. It's she's like the most cliche Irishman, but woman that you've ever seen. <laughs> recognize that there usually are explanations. And even when there aren't explanations, we're forced to recognize maybe some troubling logic. Stuff that troubles you if you really want to believe in those things. For example, if Bigfoot is real, why in this day and age when everyone has a camera on them, has no one ever got a good photo? Or how come no corpse of a Bigfoot has ever turned up or a bone? Now, being an adult means being cursed with logic, common sense. We try to live in the world of reality. Well, this is applies to this aspect of understanding our appeal at this that, that is important, I think, when looking at this true crime phenomenon. Because we're just amateurs, all right? We're not police investigators. And we have our own lives, and this is just something that we kind of do, let's call it what it is, entertainment. Now, you can... You can, a lot of people, would think, I would say most people that follow true crime are women, maybe two thirds of it. And I think the big appeal for them is they're very empathetic. And so they, they feel a connection to the victims. I think for guys, there's an aspect of trying to figure things out. But at the, at the end of the day, we're not solving these crimes or it's pretty rare for that kind of thing to happen. I think there's still a value, but you have to be aware of this Leonard Nimoy effect, unsolved mysteries, conspiracies, frame jobs. This is all juicy stuff. Let me be honest, before Turtle's first story on Karen Reed back in April 18th, I had no interest in that story. What made me interested after Turtle's story was the conspiracy. The weird things like a 227 search for how long to die in the cold. The compelling story of a Boston cop possibly killed inside another Boston cop's home. A okay, all right. So <laughs> Plevin says something pretty interesting here where he's like, we have to use our common sense. None of us are law enforcement investigators. We're amateurs, right? I mean, we are. He's right about that. Sure. Um, we're amateurs, right? And he's like, but then he says something like, or, or well, prior to that, he says, you know, we have to use our common sense. 
Nobody's ever captured a picture of Bigfoot. So, you know what I mean? It's crazy to believe in Bigfoot. We have to use our common sense. And he's trying to equate this to a conspiracy theory amongst cops to cover up a murder, right? So he's, he's, he's trying to compare the two, but here's the problem. He's right about the fact nobody's caught a picture of Bigfoot. Sure. Fair enough, Plevin. But the problem is, is that we have actually seen pictures of the McCabe's and the Alberts together on several different occasions. We've seen pictures of Jennifer McCabe's car at Trooper Proctor's house. We've learned that there is evidence of the Proctors and the, the Alberts having a uh, relationship. Uh, we, we, I mean, there's, there's even more. <laughs> so you're, you're sitting here trying to compare things that aren't comparable. Um, it's a bad example to use at this point. It's ridiculous to act like it's far fetched. Like you sound stupid. Now you sound stupid. Because it's ridiculous now to act like it's not it, like it's crazy and far fetched. You sound like an idiot trying to gaslight the rest of us into thinking we're crazy because we see signs of what seems to be an obvious conspiracy. There is absolutely at least evidence of a conflict of interest, of many conflict of interest, not just one, but several. And it's all different degrees, different angles. You've got Proctors and the McCabe's. You've got the McCabe's and the Proctors. You've got the 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 the, the McCabe's and the Alberts. You've got the the Proctors and the McCabe's. Uh, Proctors and the Alberts. I mean, it, it it's all over the place, and it's all of these people through different channels, absolutely connected. So to sit here and act like we're crazy and try to make us feel like we're crazy because we see something wrong with this when it comes to a murder investigation, that of a police officer, well, then, no, you're the one that's crazy. Seriously, like at this point that you could sit there with a straight face and act like there's something wrong with us because we see something wrong with all of these things that turtle boy has uncovered and that the defense is presenting to the public and to the judge it makes no sense that you would go there a girlfriend falsely falsely accused those were all things that i found compelling another thing that i think we have to kind of be aware of is what i guess prosecutors call is the csi effect and this is the idea that we don't really because none of us have ever been involved with a criminal investigation or very few of us, I'm sure something somewhere in chat, there are some people that tune in that do have law enforcement experience or experience for a prosecutor's office, but most of us don't. And so our understanding of these things is, and actually I think it's pretty cool that a case like this draws us in. So we've learned so much. I know I've learned a lot, even though I have followed other cases before and I've already always been interested in the law, but I still learned a ton by really following this case very closely and also the Delphi murders, which we'll go in, get into in a minute. But this is, so this is the CSI effect is what the prosecutors call it. And this is something that they have to handle juries in a very different way now because now people have this expectation from watching a lot of tv shows on this that everything is going to be tied up very neatly but in the real world it's not like that the real world is gray and it is very rare that every you're going to get you're never going to get this cut and dry investigation with is, is that a thing the csi effect and i'm not trying to challenge him i'm saying i i've never heard of that um but i mean and if it if it isn't a thing it should be that I agree with because there's a big difference. I've actually talked about this a lot. There's a big difference between what you see on TV and what you see here. But I find it very interesting. And what you see on TV and what you see in real true crime cases that when you cover them, it, including the documentaries, because the documentaries kind of speed you through everything. You're trying to fit in months and months and months, sometimes years into a couple of hours or even four episodes you know, uh, <laughs> of a case. So it's interesting that he brings it up and he says the CSI effect, which I guess means, you know, there's, there's what you see on TV versus the reality of what, what an investigation entails, uh, as far as what, um, a, a, a prosecution entails. So, the thing is, 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 is I find it interesting that he's using this example 
when I constantly hear him, constantly seem to hear him say things like, you know, well, if if the defense had all this proof from the feds, why didn't they bring it up at that hearing? Like he 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 criticized Yanetti and Jackson for not bringing up what they brought up in the last hearing, the hearing before that. And he said, "Why why didn't they bring that up? If they have it, why they were in court? Why didn't they have it?" And right there, that is the example of somebody who is 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 who falls under the the. the falls victim to the CSI effect for lack of a better term, right? So here he is using the CSI effect and saying, Hey, and he's trying to warn you of it and say, Hey, don't fall under that. Don't fall under the, the, the CSI effect. But here he is talking like he, he, he expects court to just work like it does on fucking TV. Because when they're having a hearing that is literally to determine dates that they're going to address motions. Not even the hearing is set to address those motions. These are hearings set to address the dates in which they can work out those motions. There's a motion to move the date and, and switch the dates around because of, in lieu of the new findings of... Uh, of the federal investigation and they want to be able to 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 they at the time they wanted to be able to review it and present their case to the judge as far as um why they the judge should rule in their favor on their motion to dismiss and their motions to disqual and their motion to disqualify so that hearing before this last one was only to set a date for that. Only to decide whether or not that motion is going to go through. And it's I and it's still strange to me. I have to point out. It's still strange to me that the motion to 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 dismiss and disqualify. See, you all distract me with the chat, man. <laughs> um, it's still strange to me that the motion to to move the dates due to the federal investigative findings, um, that was a joint motion. It wasn't just the defense's motion. It was a motion... It was a joint motion from the defense and the prosecution. So that's all on Aunt Beth. All of that. The fact that they moved forward with it, she was like, well, you have just over a week. You have until that Monday to come up with your case. I suggest you get started is basically what she said. He was like, that's not enough time. There's 3,100 pages to this document. There's 1.3 gigabytes of data. How are we supposed to prepare? And she said, well, you know what? You'll have all day if you want. So you better just, that's the date we're moving forward to there. And you better have it all, have as much as you can ready. That's my suggestion to you. And you'll have all day to do it, which she turned around and said, no, you got 10 minutes when, when that day came. But it was a, a joint motion. So I have to question auntie bev's motives here as far as this going to trial like i i don't see with everything that has come to light i do not see how she can expect to rule against this motion to dismiss and not face some sort of reprimand for it after i just i don't understand how she expects to do that so that's the only reason why at this point, because I, I, the part of me that doesn't, that, that expects her to make this go to trial is the part of me that understands that she seems to want this to go to trial. And the other part of me or, or in, in, well, 
the part of me that thinks that she's going to go to trial with this is that she uh, a wants this to go to trial and B she hasn't made any sound decisions. She seems to have not made any sound decisions. She seems to be short with more short with the defense than she does with the prosecution. Those reasons are why I reserve the possibility in my mind that this will go to trial for only those reasons. Those are three reasons. No other reasons other than those. Well, if she wanted it out of her hands, then I mean, she would, there, there's got to be something that if she wanted it out of her hands, I don't know what you do because you can't dismiss and you can't move on to trial. Um, so if she wants it out of her hands, then then get another judge to do it. You know, like, I don't know, fake a family member's death or something. I don't know. Get out of it. But But this is somebody's life that we're talking about here. And this is millions of dollars in taxpayer money if this goes to trial. Millions. Well, there's nothing that you can, that a defense team can't point a spotlight at. That's what I and think. And say, aha, uh -huh, or something like that. Or with it, or That's what I think, Patty clear. Murphy. That just rarely is going to happen. You take even things like fingerprint evidence or DNA evidence. Or you know Patty Murphy's Irish. Are you drinking today, Patty Murphy? You know Patty Murphy's Irish. You know it. <laughs> Blood. Those are things that are very seldom going to be 100%. There's always, it's, it involves labs and testing and humans that have to gather it. So there's always going to be ways to raise some doubt about certain aspects of that. So a jury is going to have to look at a whole bunch of these things together and make a very common sense decision because otherwise we'll never convict anybody and we'll never get bad guys off the streets. So this CSI effect is apparently real. The other thing I want to talk about is what I call the standard defense strategy of right odd on. things. <clears throat> and this ties in a little bit to, to the Leonard Nimoy effect with our interest in mysteries and things like that. But what happens is, is uh, let's say you were to go back and look at Jack the Ripper, which was an unsolved case, right? Century, over a century old. And the fact that it's been unsolved with so many different suspects proposed over, over a century, it's truly an unsolved case, right? And so things that might've occurred at the time that we can look at that, that seem really, really odd, those could be important. They could be meaningful because any one of those odd things might have the clue that is needed to break the case, right? But odd things are present in every case. There's no exception in every case because these okay. are, I'm, I'm talking about large cases like a murder case. Plevin made that shit up. Not the CSI effect. I looked it up. I just looked up the Leonard Nimoy effect. That's a guy, that's, that's got to be the nerdiest fucking trekky fanboyist bullshit fucking term I've ever fucking heard. The Leonard Nimoy effect is not a thing. I don't know what the fuck he's talking about when he keeps saying the Leonard Nimoy effect. What does that mean? That's not a thing. I just looked it up. Nobody ever has ever put anything on the internet that says the Leonard Nimoy effect before Plevin. So, I don't know what the fuck he's talking about. Uh, any large case, though, or even things like a, a big event like 9-11 or the JFK assassination. There are always going to be a lot of odd things, things that really seem kind of mysterious or hard to explain. Now, the thing is, is whether oh my God. those odd things are actually... Cherry, I said Trekkie, okay? That means Star Trek, right? Cherry just doesn't... Cherry seriously doesn't know the difference between Star Trek and Star Wars, by the way, so... <laughs> are actually meaningful or not and it varies so if a case is unsolved or if the evidence is not very compelling to the solution to the case then those odd things become more meaningful however if the case is pretty solid and the evidence is really hard to refute then those odd things because they'll still be there just become odd things they just become curiosities because they're always going to exist in every case now at this early stage, there's way more odd things because we haven't had the trial yet. And that's going to be the case. So we're going to go through this with every... Shatner is Yoda, by the way. 
true crime case that we look into at this stage where there hasn't been a trial yet, there's going to be a ton of really odd things that and the and defense teams are really good. There's there already is a ton of really odd things. That's why this shouldn't go to trial. At pointing those things out and making them oh. seem bigger than they are. They're really you have to be really careful because defense teams are magicians with wording too. So the way they word things, the non-human hair, the gap in the library video, none of those things existed. Okay. But the defense stirred up quite a stir just by using that choice word. And they did the gap in the library video absolutely exists. That a lot, as I pointed out in the last video, in the most recent hearing, when they were saying that the state had <laughs> uh, exculpatory evidence in the data that they did not give over to the grand jury. That's just when they're talking about the data, of course, they were talking about the 227 search. And that's just a lie. The defense was using the updated version of the program, Celebrate, and it didn't produce a 227 AM search. It produced searches that all three were at 623 and 624. Bro. A federal expert independently independently tested yes i have yes i went over it that was my first time i think going over plevin was when he was like well stuff is just stuff stuff equals just stuff genius bro fucking absolute and utter genius Wow. Um, Alan Jackson knows that. All right. So this is, we're seeing this every single day in here. People <laughs> like Olivia, like Olivia uh, in this are pointing out every day odd Beam things. Up, and a lot of people me. just seem to have a hard time looking through it. They're looking past it. They get distracted by that instead of focusing on the key evidence. Oh my God. Which in this case is very strong. You know, you have the GPS that shows the drive to go. Yes. I think we got a super dance. Nay, thank you so much. Any one of those odd things could be the thing. <laughs> Give me the song. You totally got the song. You know you got the song. <laughs> the Apple Health app is an excellent app. But it's not designed to track location. It's just, it, it, that's not its purpose. GPS is designed to do that by the military. And so it's the most accurate thing that there is. So um, that, that evidence is very solid. There's a whole it bunch is, of other reasons to... to it is it. designed to track movement, though. And the movement that it tracked was going up three different flights of stairs. Or going up and, or, uh, going up and down stairs three times. I mean, it's 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 there, dude. Understand that John didn't go in the house, but that thing is enough where you can just stand on that and say, okay, it must be something else. And I don't know, it, it doesn't seem like, I don't know when the police had that information. If it took days, weeks, months, I don't know. Once they did, they certainly had, I, you know, let's be fair, I, by that point, they already had made up their mind that it was a hit and run. But still, once they had that information, they definitely had no reason to investigate anything regarding the house. And that's just, it is what it is, you know? Um, and then you look at so how did they get to the conclusion that it was a hit and run? Because they figured this out what day one by doing what? Just asking a couple questions by doing what? By interviewing their friends, hmm? by not finding any evidence at all by collecting blood in ways that you should not be collecting blood by collecting uh, or by, by blowing away evidence with a leaf blower. I mean, w which way? <laughs> like, let's get real here, dude. Like that's, that's how they came to the conclusion that he was hit by a car and it was a hit and run by interviewing by 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 being law enforcement officers who interviewed their friends the fuck out of my face look at as i've said you look at the 
the, whether or not the physical evidence. So John didn't go in the house, but maybe someone else hit him, right? Uh, is it a coincidence that Karen's tail had just broken? Well, she did back into John's vehicle in the car. It doesn't seem like she backed into it hard enough to do much damage, but who knows, right? But there are other things. Those taillight pieces were buried in the snow and there was just no opportunity to tamper with her vehicle. And there was no real opportunity to plant that evidence. There was also microscopic taillight pieces found in John's clothing. There was um, a piece of the cocktail glass that John had in his hand and the broken pieces that were found at the scene. Well, a small piece of that was embedded in the bumper. There was John's DNA was found in the car. Now, you can point to those things and say, well, maybe it was all manufactured, fabricated. But to do that, now you're getting into an extremely elaborate conspiracy that involves multiple troopers. And so I mean, the more people that are involved like that. It's not that elaborate. You want to know why it's not that elaborate? Because we can see, all see that it's a fucking conspiracy. See, that's the thing is I'll agree with you in the fact that it is a conspiracy, but it's not elaborate. Otherwise, we wouldn't have been able to spot the fact that it's a conspiracy. That's the, the issue is nobody here fucking thinks that it was elaborate at all. Oh my goodness. I think we got a super cat. Super cat. I think we got a super cat. Super cat. Super cat. Super cat. I think we got a super cat. I think we got a super cat. I think we got a super cat. I think we got a. Oh my goodness. Let me read them in order. Uh, Samantha's like, why is uh, Canone so impartial uh, or why isn't she impartial in siding with the defense in the, in, in the Chestnut trial? Oh, why is she so impartial in siding with the defense in the Chestnut trial? But she is like a robot in the Karen case. I have no idea. If I had to guess, I'd say it's because she doesn't want to fuck this up um, in some way uh, n and it not go to trial. She wants this to go to trial. It's clear to me that there's there's plenty to indicate that she wants this to go to trial for whatever reason. Um, but uh, I, if I had to guess, my opinion is because it's a high profile case and she has political aspirations and she wants this on her resume, so to speak. Uh, Scott McGinnis says, who will play Plevin in the faded TV series? Uh, Plevin casting call will be deep. Uh, how many actors... Will they have to audition to find his character? Um, I mean, what do you do? I mean, what's the casting call for? You, you, you get a fucking potato, an eggplant, and a turnip to fucking stand, sit there still and read out loud. And you've got Plevin. How am I supposed to decide? You know what I mean? Like, there's literally, I mean, <laughs> I just got, uh, I mean, let's just face it. The guy's got the personality of a fucking brake pedal. You know, it's, <laughs> there's, there's nothing here. I mean, literally, you could just pick a fucking no name actor out of a fucking hat and be like, that's him. You know, like that, the more and more unlikely it is. So the combination of that with the, impo and thank the you impossibility guys. of tampering with that, that and vehicle and, and the extremely uh, Samantha, I limited, you. A, a limited opportunity to plant that evidence because there were numerous troopers at the scene and a news crew and the evidence was buried deep in the snow. Those things are stuff that we have to keep in mind. So again, that's my third phenomena here. And that's called the standard defense strategy of odd things. Now I want to, um, before we get to Morrissey, I want to spend some time on Delphi. Um, let me, bro. All right, let's first. Just, I'm a, you can't mute yourself when you do that, dude. I do that all. Listen, full disclosure, dude. I cough. I clear my throat. I swallow fucking coffee, dude. I sneeze. You know what I mean? I sniffle. Like. But the thing is, is I realize that that y'all don't want to fucking hear that shit. I chew gum a lot, but I don't do it while I'm live because I realize you guys don't want to fucking hear that shit. You know what I mean? Like, how are you going to be like right there with a mic in front of your face on camera and be like, <clears throat> you know, like, come on, bro. Like. 
hear me right now. Oh, you can hear me now because. You know, like it's not that hard, dude. You just mute your mic for a second. Even if I not, if I don't have that feature on this mic, uh, do this. I could just. You didn't even hear me sneeze right then, did you? You know what I'm saying? Like it's not that difficult. He's using the same software I am. I could tell. I'm gonna play a quick and a very quick version. Of Let's see if we can turn this volume down. All right. So this, I showed you this the other day. This video was created by Gray Hughes, and it really does a good job of matching up the timeline. I'm going to play it again here at eight times the speed so we can get through it super quick for the people that missed it. Yeah. Now, Gray Hughes is fantastic. Uh, I have nothing but positive things to say about Gray Hughes uh, as far as him being a true crime creator. But just to remind him. So this is the Monon High Bridge, Bridge Trail in Delphi, Indiana. Uh, what you see, those three dots right there on the screen, those are um, three adolescent girls that were on the trail uh, and that we'll see walking the encounter the accused catcher, killer Richard, Richard Allen uh, in a couple minutes but just to point out so you see the creek there it's about a foot deep so it's a shallow creek and that bridge you see crossing it continues I wish I could point to it here but it, it continues for a substantial distance and you'll see afterwards when we forward this a little bit where the girls are taken so the bridge is it's an old train bridge and I think it's like 700 feet long or 800 feet long something like that so let's just play this and show how Richard Allen's own words sink him all right, so these girls, here they are. They're walking back to the beginning of the trail. It's only a mile-long trail. And that's Richard Allen in the black car pulling up the top and parking up there. He walks down, and he enters the trail right as the girls are leaving. And the girls describe him, and he describes them. And he just, the girls described him very accurately, accurately right down to the clothing he was wearing, clothing which he also described wearing himself. Now, this is what I say described. A, the next day, either two days or the next day after Richard Allen, after, I'm sorry, after the, the girls' bodies were found, Richard Allen arranged to meet a uh, conservation officer now, this was an all hands on deck. This is a small town. So this is multiple. Everybody that was remotely connected to law enforcement was called in to be part of this massive investigation. So I'm not sure how it was that a conservation officer instead of a regular police officer. Yeah. That's who interviewed him. The Delphi case is two victims. Yeah. Abby and Livy. Right. And he put himself at the crime scene from 130 to 330. Exactly. Did he say three? Last year. So he didn't he didn't lie. Now, why did he turn it? Why did he go in and seek out? law enforcement to do that. We don't know, but we think maybe it's because it's a small town of 2,000 people. He worked at the photo counter at the CVS. So probably a large percentage of people, almost everybody in the town would have recognized I mean, his face. I'm not going to hold that against him because he seems to know a lot about the case. He at least seems to know more about it than I do. I mean, yeah, so he got that detail wrong. He could have just misspoke because um, he seems to know at least certain things about the case. I'll give him that. You know, I'm not trying to I'm not up here just trying to like unfairly tear somebody apart. I'm going to tear apart, apart their bullshit. So far, I'm not hearing any bullshit. So maybe he thought he got made, but you know, we don't know for now why he did that. All right. So this here is a young adult who arrived at the bridge well, at the time. So she saw Richard Allen standing partway onto the bridge. She found him creepy. So she turned around and uh, you see the other two dots approaching. That's Abby and Libby. So they pass Abby and Libby. We don't know if they saw Allen before they got on the bridge. Maybe he'll tell us someday, but we don't know exactly if he hid in the woods or if he just passed him and turned around. So this bridge was like a perfect trap because only kids would have walked to the end most of the time. And Richard Allen would have known that. And it's at the end of the bridge is uh, private property. There's no trail there. So people that kids would go to the end of the bridge on a dare and then just turn around and come back. Adults would not bother to walk down there. They would just walk out over on the creek. And I said it was a very long bridge. So Richard Allen would know that this was a perfect trap. That once kids started, they would go on it. They would most kids on a dare would go to the end. And then he had them to himself. So he gets to the end of the bridge there. Says the guy's down the hill. He uses a gun to kidnap him. And right there, that's the location where the girls were found. Again, I've got this speeded up. Here. I'm just waiting for him to get to the part where this has something to do with John O'Keefe. Here, he spends a couple hours with the bodies. Hopefully, the girls didn't suffer. We don't, you know, we may find out more. Trump. Then he walks up here. Um, I got it fast here, so you missed it. But there was a car that drove by and saw him on the road, or someone that met his uh, description as muddy and bloody and looking like he'd been in a fight and he goes back to his car which was parked at an unusual place that was yeah he he's not i mean i you know i i don't know enough about the delphi case to to call him out on any bullshit on this um so i'm not going to pretend to know about the delphi case to trash the guy that's not what i'm here to do um so um i'll let him get through this um but I'll tell you this, if I want to learn about the Delphi case, I'm not going to get it from Plevin, considering how he's been addressing 
<laughs> the uh, the John O'Keefe Karen Reed case. I'll say that much. A closed building there, but he described himself as parking there. So his own words really do sink him here. And there's plenty of other evidence. Um, there's plenty of other evidence. Well, we don't know, all, as you'll see in these trials, we never know all of the evidence until we get to the trial. But we do know from the charging documents that they found an unspent shell next to the girls' bodies that matched Here, Richard Allen's. See, this is different, though. Okay. This is different. Like, when we talk about the evidence that the prosecution has, okay, you got to think. We just watched. We just watched. Uh, I think we got a super cat. Super cat. I think we got a super cat. Super cat. Super cat. Super cat. We got a super chat. Big Billy, appreciate you. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, no, I, I remember when the Delphi thing first happened and I listened to a podcast about it. But uh, since they caught Richard Allen, I have not actually followed it. Um, I just heard about that, but I, I have not actually followed it. So I, I don't have anything to contribute to the case. Um, but Allen's gun uh, from the charging documents that they found an unspent shell. Okay. So this is the thing though. Um, like it, it, it does happen. Like, like I understand when he's saying like, we don't know what the evidence the prosecution actually has. The problem is, is that we do. And I'll tell you why we do because you got to use your eyes. Okay. There was just a motion to dismiss and disqualify, right? This is a very serious motion. I'm not going to play the song, but thank you, Big Billy. I appreciate you. Um, Because I almost lost my train of thought last time, but and I want that to happen again right now. But thank you, Big Billy. I appreciate it. Um, We just watched them file a motion and present a motion of dismissing Karen Reed's to dismiss Karen Reed's charges and to disqualify the Norfolk County D District Attorney's Office from the case. Um, and so the judge has not ruled on that yet. Uh, but Lolly had Lolly had the opportunity to oppose this motion, uh, to present his opposition to the court. And when he did so, um, he did not state at any point, we have evidence still, Your Honor, that we know beyond a reasonable doubt will convict Karen Reed. At no point did he use those words or anything like those words. Thank you so much, Big Billy. Wow, appreciate you. Um, at no point did he say anything that resembled those words. He merely, they, they presented all of this stuff the defense presented all of this stuff and Lolly was just like wrong. No, not true. That's all he did. And he said, no, this is, this is the evidence that we have. And this is why we're using it. He didn't even do that. Really? He just said everything that the defense is saying is just not true. Wrong. Your honor wrong. That's not, that tells me that they have we the public knows everything that they plan on using against Karen Reed, especially when you look at the charging documents or whatever. Now, whatever the the whatever the Karen Reed's whatever they have to have probable cause to convict Karen Reed to even charge her. They have to have probable cause. They did everything they could after charging her to present probable cause and yet still failed, which is fascinating. Still failed. So, um, basically, they were hanging on the word of, I believe, all right. Yeah, you earned it, buddy. You got it. I think we got a super cat. Super cat. 
I think we got a super dance. Super dance. Super dance. Super dance. We got a super chat. I think we got a super chat. Hey, there you go. Thank you, Big Billy. Again, I appreciate you, buddy. Um, there you <laughs> appreciate you. Thank you. Next to the girls' bodies that matched Richard Allen's gun. Um, let's see. Oh, um, so yeah, what I was saying was was I mean they 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 we we've heard of everything that they plan on using to convict Karen Reed. You know how else I know that they have no ace up their sleeve? You know how I know that they don't have something that they have not mentioned? Because the defense would already be aware of this. The defense would absolutely be aware of this. Ariel, member for one month, thank you so much. Love your content. Keep up the good work. Uh, I will. I appreciate you. Uh, thank you so much. Um, we know this because they have reached, they have engaged in desperate actions. They have attempted desperate acts, such as arresting Turtle Boy, such as seizing Karen's phones, such as flying all the way to from Boston to California in order to interview someone and get jack shit on that interview. So there's, this is how I know. This is how common sense tells me what my eyes tell me when I use them, that the prosecution has nothing other than the stuff that they're stating that they have. There's no, there's no ace up the sleeve there's no rabbit to come out of a hat that's not going to happen we're fully aware of the prosecution's case and how they intend to prosecute we are all fully aware of it so um if plevin thinks that Karen Reed is guilty and is going to be proven guilty in a court of law based on the idea that the prosecution still has evidence that we are unaware of? No. I, I, I'm sorry to disappoint you, Plevin. There is just no way that they would have reached these, uh, these links. In such obviously desperate attempts that they are failing at, like assigning Ken Mello to Turtle Boy's case, charging the Canton Nine for protesting, for just standing across the street of the and &E Pizza. That's it, it, these are desperate acts. I mean, you could sit there and 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 justify them just be, by reciting chapter twenty eight. 13a 13b you can do that all day sure but it doesn't change the fact that it's a fucking incredibly broad law that is probably never applied and seems to be designed for weaponizing against people who are trying to hide behind the first amendment that's what it seems like it is. Now, you are sitting here saying, well, they broke the law, they broke the law. I'm telling you that if you use your eyes, you can absolutely see that this law is being weaponized. And it's they're, it's being weaponized because they're desperate, because we heard it. Now I know for sure. Now I know for sure because I heard Lolly try to apply it both in his opposition motion in writing and when he presented it verbally to Beverly Canone. So when he expressed this verbally, I was like, they have nothing. This is, this is incredible. They have jack shit. He is, he has just confirmed to me as I'm watching this live with turtle boy and Brian, he has just confirmed to me 
that they don't have jack shit. <laughs> That's why it's mind boggling if if Beverly Canone does not dismiss these charges because I'm trying to tell you that based on the weak case that the prosecution clearly has, as weak as it is, I can't imagine Judge Bev allowing this trial to go on without expecting, especially with the federal investigation involved, without expecting some sort of reprimand for doing so. I cannot imagine. I'm going to repeat that one more time. With what, on top of, with everything that we know, on top of with the federal investigation being attached to it, I cannot see Beverly Canone not dismissing this and it going to trial without her expecting some sort of reprimand. That's crazy to me. And this is important too, obviously. When Richard Allen was in prison this past spring, over the prison phone, which those calls are recorded and prisoners know that, he confessed to his wife multiple times that he killed the girls. Now, the defense has a theory for all this stuff, right? You know, they have to now account for that confession. You know, was he having a mental breakdown? Well, they, that's not the theory they went with. So we'll see in a second. Let me um, pull up this really, this document that came out that is really fascinating. And I think you're going to find a lot of this to be interesting and relevant just in general for true crime cases and also if, for the Karen Reed case. Um, you're going to see some of this stuff and say, yeah, especially if this is the first case that you've... So Richard Allen, just to explain things a little bit, we all have a right to a speedy trial that's in the Constitution. Each state has its own rules on that. Richard Allen has requested that speedy trial. You might say, why are they doing that? So right now the trial is scheduled for May. Um, probably the reason is, as we see as we go through this, is that it, pre it places an enormous burden on the prosecutors to get all their eggs lined up. Because as we've seen in the Karen Reed case too, these documents, you know, stuff like lab evidence and things like that, testing takes a long time to do. It, it really does. So, um, so we think that's probably why he's doing the speedy thing. And you're gonna see, so the defense put out a, an elaborate theory back in, I think September, that Richard Allen was completely innocent. That wasn't anywhere near, we, we know he was at. Okay. So, On my third cup pot of coffee, I get up, I take a leak, and as I'm taking a leak, I'm listening to Plevin, and I realize exactly what he's doing. <laughs> Plevin recently had a boost in views, and he, he wants to take advantage of his boost in views. And so what he wants to do is he wants to get the people who were listening to him about Karen Reed and watching about Karen Reed, not realizing that they're mostly just views because they see that he's a clown <laughs> and he's thinking, well, I'm, if I take these views, the people who are viewing me for Karen Reed, I can transition them and get them interested in my coverage of the Delphi case, which is what he's doing. He's, not making any actual comparison between the two cases. Not really. He's trying to, um, what's up, Spectre Report? Um, right, hate watches. I, I just don't call them hate watches, Spectre Report, because I don't hate Plevin. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, I just, I find him funny. Um, Big Billy, welcome. Appreciate you, buddy. Um, I, I, my whole thing with Plevin is, is, is I can see what he's doing and he's trying to get, he's trying to get those viewers. He's trying to pick up uh, his views on his um, uh, Delphi coverage. Uh, he wants to solidify himself as a true crime channel that discusses everything, all, everything and anything true crime, uh, which is, is not going to work. Um and, you know, the three card Monty uh, in Karen Reed and reasonable doubt in the Delphi murders. Now, he spent just maybe a few minutes talking about Karen Reed so that we can't accuse him of clickbait. But we'll see if he gets back into Karen Reed. Um, so but, yeah, this is clearly what he's trying to do. This is an attempt to to blend the the viewers. To get the views. 
Um, so he's got over a thousand views here. And we'll see. This is his last, his most recent live. Let's see what happens next live. He was at the trail but that day. I don't but give a defense, shit. He didn't leave the trail. About and that he had nothing to do with the killing of the girls. The Delphi that they were in case. fact killed by an Odin cult, a cult of Odin. And that a cult. This is a screenplay that I wrote once again recently. And not so much that I don't give a shit about the Delphi case. It's that I don't give a shit about Kevin's take on the Delphi case. <laughs> And I was pretty critical of it. If Thank you, you Billy. Wow. DA Morrissey's. Appreciate you. Let's go the wrong way. DA Morrissey's um, press conference from, not a press conference, but the, the speech that he read out in September. So let's go over this and we'll stop a couple of times in the middle to point out where I think some of his wording is troubling. This will be the first statement of its kind in my dozen years as a park district attorney. So it's a rare statement, the first of its kind in 12 years. Very rare. The harassment of witnesses in the murder no. prosecution of Karen Reed is absolutely no. It's it's not rare, Plevin. It's not rare. Okay. It's unprecedented. Okay. Very important. Big difference. Rare means rare that it happens sometimes, not often. But it happens. Unprecedented means it's never been done before. It's, it's, it's the first of its kind, as he says. Absolutely baseless. It should be an outrage to any decent person, and it needs to stop. I would quibble a little bit with that wording, and that whether the it needs to stop harassment is baseless or based is irrelevant. You can't harass witnesses. So, uh, you know, innuendo is not evidence. False narratives are not evidence. However, what evidence does show is that John O'Keefe never entered the home at 34 Fairview Road in Canton the night he died. Now, that's absolutely true. Uh, but Unity takes offense at this. So I don't know. It does get into these gray areas where, you know, what if the what if the prosecution's theory is not as fully established as it is here? Can they still make a statement? Yanetti takes offense to this because it's offensive. Because these these men and women refer to each other as brothers and sisters in the law, right? So Yanetti absolutely takes offense to this. Clubber, stop trying to dig up the floor, buddy. Yanetti absolutely takes offense to this because it's, it's, this is unethical. And he has the advantage. He, he, he represents the people of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. So he has this advantage. So, of course, Yanetti is going to take offense to this. He takes professional and personal offense to it. If Yanetti values himself, as he stated that as he as he stated that he does, as a as a, as someone who practices the law. Someone who has worked for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And he's also named people, one of them being his mentor, as people who have set the proper example as prosecutors and as dist district attorneys. And this is a far cry from it. And Yanetti's experience... As a litigator, he absolutely has the right to bring that up and say that in open court. He is offended by the lack of ethics from District Attorney Michael Morrissey. And the overwhelming evidence that we've seen, not just this video, this video just being the tip of the iceberg of questionable decision making, as far as ethics go, I mean, there's a lot of it. <laughs> there's just simply a lot of it. Michael Morrissey is, is is has has engaged in very questionably unethical behavior throughout this case. I cannot blame an honest lawyer. I know that's an oxymoron, but I cannot blame as honest as I've seen a lawyer 
or I think a lawyer can get, I cannot blame them for being offended by this. On top of all the other stuff that we've seen Michael Morrissey do. I mean, just the letters. The letters to the U.S. Attorney's Office. I mean, that's crazy. Statement like that. So Unity would say no because they're trying to go or they seem to be trying to go with a third-party culprit theory that he was killed in the house. Location data from his phone recovered from the lawn beneath his body when he was transported to the hospital shows that his phone did not enter that home. 11 people have given statements that they did not see John O'Keefe enter the home at 34th Bivu that night. All he says Zero 13. People. He says 11. They saw him enter the home. Zero. No one. And I don't, as I think um, Lally did a really good job pointing out in <laughs> legally, in legal terms, in their reply the other day at the hearing, that the only way that making a statement like this is justified is because of the strange circumstances, not just the witness intimidation, but the fact that this witness intimidation was heavily prompted by the defense team itself. So if you had witness intimidation without those connections, Shut maybe that'd be more of a problem. But the fact that they, the defense... Shut the fuck up, you cunt! Shut it! Dude, <laughs> this was not justified. This was absolutely not justified. Okay. There was no gag order and the defense was absolutely within their rights to explain to the press why they feel that their client is innocent. They have the right to defend themselves against the court of public opinion, because in the court of public opinion, the person on trial is already guilty. Ninety nine point nine 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 percent of the time, the person on trial is already guilty. So therefore, that's why the defense, if there's no gag order, has every right. To try to win. Win over the court of public opinion, it's a perfectly logical ethical and tactical thing to do as a defense nothing wrong with that at all now it's different when you're the prosecutor because when you're the prosecutor you are supposed to still go into this as innocent until proven guilty therefore you have not michael morrissey you have not been given the opportunity to prove her guilt yet. So therefore, any actions that you take until that time in order to make her seem guilty is unethical because in the eyes of the law, she is still innocent and you are not given a court-appointed opportunity yet to prove her guilt. Therefore, you ethically have to treat Karen Reed as though she is innocent until the day comes that she is on trial. Period. That is your job. That is your obligation. That is why Yanetti said that what you did was unethical. Because you tried to influence the public for her to, to, to be, to, you tried to influence the public to believe that she was guilty before she even had a chance to stand trial. That is unethical on your part. Because you represent the people of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts and you are obligated to seek justice, not a win. You are obligated to seek justice, not a conviction. A conviction you're allowed to seek only if it is in the interest to serve justice. There's no way to tell that until she goes to trial. There is no way to determine that fairly until she is on trial. That is why Michael Morrissey and what she, that is why Michael Morrissey and what he did is being considered unethical. This is not justified, Plevin. This is not justified. Defense team was part of that strategy. Seems to justify the extraordinary step of doing this. Some have, without any evidence, pointed to an 18-year-old Colin Albert, a nephew of the homeowner, and accused him of attacking John O'Keefe as he entered the home. But phone evidence shows O'Keefe never entered the home at all. 
testimony from witnesses tell us that 18 year old Colin Elvin had left his uncle's home before John O'Keefe and Karen Reed had arrived outside the residence. There was no fight inside that home. John O'Keefe did not enter the home. Colin Elvin, the young man being vilified, was not present. Yeah, see, that's unethical right there. You cannot, you, 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 you're, you're, you're presenting a case outside of a courtroom against an innocent woman. And I say this, I'm see, I'm saying an innocent mo woman as far as the eyes of the law go. I'm not talking about how we see her. I'm not talking about why we say free care and read. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about simple ethics in the eyes of the law. Karen Reed, at this point when he made this video, and to this point today, because she has not stood on trial and been convicted, she is absolutely innocent in the eyes of the law. So for him to say the things that he's saying is 100% unethical. But when Reed's vehicle and John O'Keefe arrived on the street, this is a false narrative. And if, but I think up to here, this is very solid ground. I mean, you can't just go around. Defense teams can't just baselessly start smearing people as part of a third party if there's no evidence. And there was no evidence. There's never been any evidence that John went in the house. And there's no evidence that Colin was in a fight. And there's no and there, the evidence is that Colin was gone from the scene by, by the time that John and Karen arrived there. But here's the problem, though. Here's the problem. Is it's not, it's not on the defense to prove that. It's not on the defense to provide evidence that John O'Keefe entered the home. It's on the prosecution to provide evidence that he did not. And so far, all the evidence that the prosecution seems to have, and that's entertaining your notion that we haven't seen everything, but all of the evidence that the prosecution seems to have it, it is riddled with doubt. All of it riddled with doubt. And so if it's on the prosecution, see, that's the thing is it's not on the defense to prove that John went into the house. It's on the prosecution to prove that he never did. It's on the prosecution to prove that John never entered that home. And every piece of evidence points to, well, whether it does or not. Every, every piece of evidence that that points to John O'Keefe going in or never going into the house has doubt. They, I mean, from the word jump, the lead investigator, the conflict of interests, everything. This is all stuff that a jury is going to consider. And if a juror has to simply even ask themselves the question and not come up with a definitive answer well they cannot convict Karen Reed they just can't it is unethical for this thing to even go to trial considering everything that we know about what already contains reasonable doubt with everything that we already know it's beyond unethical for judge bev to let this thing go to trial that's why i say that she is most likely going to face reprimand if she allows this to go to trial and that's just my uneducated opinion i could be absolutely wrong about it, but i don't believe i am because there's way too much doubt here way too much doubt So it is reasonable to, to try to take some steps to protect these people. Colin Elbert didn't commit murder. Jennifer McCabe, Matthew McCabe, and Brian Elbert. No, we have everything, Jerry. And certainly did not commit murder or any crime that night. We, we, we at least have the prosecution strategy and what they intend to try to prove. We at least have that. I'm, I'm absolutely confident of that. Um, I don't know that for a fact definitively because I've seen proof of it. What I'm saying is, is like... Everything, my my opinion is we don't have, we, we absolutely already have everything that at least their strategy and what they intend to prove. It's, 
there's too much doubt. We already know that there's too much doubt in those things. I mean, just the fact that the lead investigator is under investigation right now. His credibility is shot. Along with the grand jury, the federal grand jury testimony that just took place. That credibility is shot. The 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 federal investigation taking place, the credibility, the integrity of the investigation is shot. There is no fucking way that a jury will convict Karen Reed with everything that we know. There is no fucking way. It doesn't matter what they bring to trial. It doesn't even matter. Unless there was a separate team in charge of the investigation that we don't know about, there's no way they're gonna, that they can get a conviction against Karen Reed. They have been forthcoming with authority, providing statements, and have not engaged in any cover-up. They are not suspects in any crime. They are merely witnesses in the case. To have them accused of murder is outrageous. To have them harassed and intimidated based on false narratives and accusations is wrong. They are witnesses to the way our justice system asks of them. It and needs the to is that This is one of the reasons that people don't want to step forward and be witnesses in a case is precisely because of things like this. Uh, and so when people come forward and do that, they're doing their citizen duty, right? I mean, I lived in Charlestown. We All right. So here's Plevin trying to say that this that that it's basically Turtle Boy's fault. This is his implication here. You guys see what he did there? Well, this is exactly why witnesses don't want to come forward and testify because of all of this. No, dude. No. They're gonna come forward and testify. That's the the whole point. Like you're sitting here acting like Jen McCabe didn't file motions prior to all this, prior to Turtle Boy doing what he's been doing you're acting like she didn't fight there she didn't have an attorney she didn't lawyer up and have an attorney file a motion to where she didn't have to testify you're acting like that didn't happen all turtle boy did was try to push them into telling the truth turtle boy wants them to testify Everybody here who thinks that Karen Reed is innocent, we want those people to sit on the stand. It's the only thing that we're looking forward to in trial is seeing them get cross-examined by the defense. That's what we want. So, no, this isn't, don't sit here and act like, oh, well, you know, what Morrissey is doing right here is, is fighting that force that causes people to not want to testify in a case like as if turtle boy's charges are actually valid and he actually intimidated witnesses to not testify when he actually intimidated them with the truth if he intimidated them with anything so how do you intimidate with the truth because it's very telling if He's intimidating people in, to, to tell the truth and actually testify in order to get a fallen police officer justice. Somebody that they claim is their friend and to pressure them into testifying. And then this law that is designed to prosecute people who are, who are intimidating witnesses to not testify but it's used against somebody who's actually, it could be argued, is intimidating them to testify. Now, I don't think he intimidated anybody, is my point. I don't think Turtle Boy intimidated anybody. I don't see how he could intimidate uh, police officers. And I don't see how he could be considered a threat because he didn't threaten anybody in order to intimidate. There has to be some sort of threat involved and he didn't, he didn't threaten anyone. Right. He made Colin sad, right? <laughs> exactly. And we I, we had a murder right across the street from us, and we know there were a couple of townies that saw it, but they weren't going to tell anybody. The Charlestown Code of Silence, but in a way, you can't blame them because if the system can't protect witnesses, you know. And here, I don't know how effective this is to do this. 
I think it's probably not effective at all. You know, to go out and ask people a mob to stop acting like a mob, that doesn't work. So I don't think it was a great idea from that perspective. But I can understand under pressure from the families. No, what they the thought, system. what they thought was, if we cut off the head of the snake, well then, you know, that's it. But that's not what happened. There is no snake. That's the issue. Is is there is no snake? They thought that there was this was a, a mindless mob being led by a blogger who's got some weird popularity that nobody can figure out why. Just some loudmouth and then happened to pick up a bunch of followers. That's the way they saw it. And they figured, oh, well, if we lock up the loudmouth, well, then everybody else will disperse. But the problem is, is that they're not taking accountability. They're not self-reflecting. They're not practicing self-awareness in the sense that <laughs> those people are gathering together and supporting each other because you're the problem. That's why they're doing it. Regardless of what Turtle Boy says and does, is Turtle Boy very inspiring to them? Absolutely. Do they have gratitude to Turtle Boy for bringing a lot of the stuff that we know now into light? Sure, absolutely. But these people, make no mistake, are standing out there because they know that there's a problem where they live and you're the problem. That's why they're out there doing what they're doing. No other reason other than that. So, there is no snake here that you could cut the head off of. You know what I mean? The snake is actually the Commonwealth. Well, I shouldn't say the Commonwealth because the Commonwealth is the people. It's the Norfolk County D District Attorney's Office. That's the snake. And yes, I believe, hopefully, that if you cut off the head of the snake, since you have these officers that answer directly to Michael Morrissey. We've seen on documents where these people are identified as agents of the district attorney's office. I've seen Buchanan, Buchanan's name there. I've seen, uh, I've seen uh, Tully's name there. And I think I saw Proctor's. Even though Proctor is Massachusetts State Police, Tully is too. But every time we see Michael Morrissey in public, we see Tully right next to him. Like, like Beast Man to Skeletor. Like Starscream to Megatron. Right? I mean, tell me I'm wrong. Every time you see Michael Morrissey making a public statement somewhere, like where there's public, where there's people, I mean, you see Tully right next to him. Like Destro to Cobra Commander. <laughs> I could do this shit all day. The autopsy of John O'Keefe was conducted by a forensic pathologist from the Office of the Chief Medical Examiner. The doctor right. found that the injuries that left John helpless in the cold. More like Silent right. Bob the J, but yeah. The found that the line of abrasions on his arm was consistent with blunt trauma, not an animal attack. A grand jury of everyday citizens. Heard the documented evidence. There's that blunt trauma. Now, you guys remember from part one when I went over that blunt trauma. It's, it's, that's not blunt trauma, bro. Like, you can't expect anybody with common sense. Again, the blunt trauma thing is one of those things that, that the prosecution, the Norfolk County DDA's office, and anybody who is a, a turtle boy hater who is, yelling that Karen Reed is guilty. Anybody who says that those wounds are blunt trauma are people who believe that if you say something over and over and over again, if you say it enough and if you say it loud enough, it becomes real. It becomes is. But it's not. I don't care what you say. You're not going to convince me, a stubborn person with common sense, that those injuries are a result of blunt force trauma scratches minus bruising 
no bruising, but scratches, claw marks, bite marks, what look to be, in all fairness, clawings, and, and let's just say scratches. But there's no bruising. So you expect me to believe someone as stubborn as I am with common sense that that was caused by blunt force trauma. There's no way. In testimony before making a decision, the subject of that murder indictment enjoys the constitutional presumption of innocence. Why should the witnesses who have committed no crime be afforded less by members of the community? They should not be heard. Man, he just said that shit. So the defendant before trial doesn't deserve the presumption of innocence? Okay. For telling the government what they heard or saw. I'm asking the Canton community and everyone who feels invested in this case to hear all the actual evidence at trial before signing guilt of people who have done nothing wrong. Wow. And certainly before taking it upon yourself to harass citizens who evidence shows have done nothing in this matter but come forward and bear witness. We try people in the court and not on the internet for a reason. The internet has no rules of evidence. The internet has no punishment for perjury. And the internet does not know all the facts. Conspiracy theories are not evidence. The idea that multiple police department, EMTs, fire personnel, the medical examiner, and prosecuting agencies are joined in or taken in by a vast conspiracy should be seen for what it is, completely contrary to the evidence and a desperate attempt to reassign guilt. Michael Proctor, the state police trooper, being accused of planting evidence outside 34 Fairview Road, was never at Fairview Road on the day of the incident. Proctor and his state police partner traveled together the entire day while other officers were processing 34 Fairview. So we do have to remember there was this was the probably the biggest blizzard in 10 years, I would say, in the area. It was a very big snowstorm. So this is it did affect a lot of aspects of the investigation. Mr. Proctor was not there and did not plant evidence at 34 Fairview Road. In addition to having no opportunity to plant the evidence, as has been suggested, Proctor would have no motive to do so. Trooper Proctor had no close personal relationship with any of the parties involved in the investigation and had no conflict. Well, I mean, so we now know that this is probably not exactly true. There was a somewhat of a conflict and. <laughs> Uh, it, 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 it was not exactly true, and there was maybe uh, some form of a conflict. Uh, 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 come on, bro. You're lying. And you're a piece of shit. There was a relationship. So it was Trooper Proctor's sister, who is friends with Chris Albert's wife. But even more with Chris Albert's wife's sister, who I think is more her age, and so Smoke that's and mirrors, where the connection bro. was. But it is still Smoke a and mirrors. So uh, th there's nothing near what anybody, as far as we know, there's always the possibility of things unknown. But there's nothing that shows any kind of a motive that would justify giving up your life and your freedom to plant evidence in a murder case. And he had no reason to step out of this investigation. Yeah. Every suggestion to the because if you have the Norfolk County DA basically telling you that. Yeah, go ahead and do it. And you feel like you have the protection coming up from that high up. Sure, of course you would do it. Because you don't think that there is a risk to your freedom or your career. You think you're protected. If it's coming from the Norfolk County DA, you think you're being protected. Period. So yeah, that would be perfect reason why... Proctor would risk his job, would risk his career and his freedom because he doesn't feel that there's a risk. That's why he would do it. He doesn't believe that there would be a risk. Why would he believe that there's a risk when you have this man working so highly above you, willing to lie several times in a public statement that is unprecedented to have ever been done before not just the lying but the statement itself unprecedented to the contrary is a lie this should be seen for what it is and not used as a pretext to attack and harass others what is happening to the witnesses some with no actual involvement in the case is wrong it is contrary to the american values of fairness and the constitutional value of a fair trial it needs to stop now wow i'm releasing this Court statement rather than holding a news conference because my remarks need to be so narrowly tailored to the issue at hand. Well, the prosecution it needs to stop now, but the message is the same. What is happening to these innocent people, these witnesses, is wrong and it needs to stop. It needs to stop. So, I guess 
Morrissey's idea was that if he uses his kind of big boy voice yelling at kids that they might listen. But, you know, he had to do this. But again, I don't think any of it was really going to be effective. Had to do it. So um, as Kerry points out, Chris and Julie were not at the house. Uh, but there is a connection between the families. So in an ideal world, the trooper would not have been a part of that investigation. I'm sure he wishes that now. But and maybe it's best to not have troopers be involved in an investigation that's in the town they live in, especially if they grew up in that town. It's just probably best to avoid that when you can. Um, but again, it doesn't change the... Wow. Somebody clipped that shit. <laughs> Plevin. Yeah. You think? Because... What's going to end up happening as a result of that is that this case is going to get dismissed. And if it doesn't get dismissed, I can't imagine the judge not, who doesn't dismiss it not facing some sort of reprimand, especially since the federal government believes that there's something wrong with that. The federal government believes that that's a conflict of interest. So, yeah. Probably a good idea, Plevin. Thanks for the advice. Uh, if you're a state trooper, probably shouldn't work a homicide that is in the same town that you live in and grew up in. Right. Great advice, Plevin. Thank you. It's the fundamental evidence here. These guys didn't have any reason to think that they were investigating something to do with the Alberts. Uh, so that's why I don't think that they, they felt that there was a conflict of interest. Wait, what do you mean that they did? Wait, what? Hold on. Did he just fucking say that shit out loud? He just fucking said that shit out loud, dude. Like. When you can. Um, but again, it doesn't change the fundamental evidence here. These guys didn't have any reason to think that they were investigating something to do with the Alberts. Uh, so that's why I don't. The investigators didn't have any reason to think that this, that they were investigating anything to do with the Alberts, even though the crime scene is the home of Brian Albert, Brian and Nicole Albert. The investigators who were investigating the murder of John O'Keefe had no reason to think that what they are investigating had anything to do with the Alberts, even though the crime scene was 34 Fairview Road, which was owned by Brian and Nicole Albert. Okay, Plevin. Wow. <laughs> I mean, dude, you're killing me right now. I don't think that they, they felt that there was a conflict of interest until this conspiracy theory emerged you know, over a year later. So to them, it was a hit and run. And to David Yannetti, Days after Karen's first arraignment, it was the same thing. It was a hit and run. And that's what he said. My client had no intention. So I think David Yannetti looked at it the same way as Michael Proctor, as the same as everybody. Now, maybe people were guilty of tunnel vision, as happened in the Delphi murders, right? But again, I don't think that that applies in this case here, just because the actual evidence is very powerful. It's very, I would say, yeah, I think it's fair to say slam dunk. Now, that does you can have something be slam dunk, and at the same time, Wait, the, you're telling me that the, the Karen Reed case is, is a slam dunk? That the prosecution has a slam dunk case against Karen Reed? It is the furthest thing from a slam dunk. The fact of the matter is, is that if this went to trial, this case would be an air ball for the prosecution. An air ball. I'm talking a fucking... Buzzers about to buzz and half court fucking toss way into the stands. This is the furthest thing from a slam dunk. This is it's it's incredible that you would even say that out loud about this case and about what the prosecution thinks. I mean, why would you come to that conclusion, my friend? I have no idea. I'm retarded. <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. All right. Create reasonable doubt. In fact, one of the things that I was wondering was, let's look at, say, the Richard Allen case, right? And let's say that, let's say that um, you're, you're on the jury and you're sitting there and you're looking at what might be misconduct on the part of the investigators or, you know, for instance, if they 
don't turn all, over all the files right away or there's some decept deceptive comment about that, something that even does result in some kind of sanction, right? Now, if you're a jury looking at that, there is a case to be made for acquitting because we want our prosecutors and our police to be on the up and up. And so they'll weigh that, right? But in that case there, they'll have to also weigh the fact that if someone like Richard Allen, if he's guilty of doing those terrible crimes against those innocent girls that, that he didn't even know, then releasing him on some kind of principle is dangerous and it could result in some other kids getting killed because he's a killer. So they have to weigh all that, right? Uh, and I think the same thing will apply in the Karen case, but much different. So when you're weighing, balancing, if prosecutorial or police or investigatory mistakes were made, then on the other hand, when you weigh the dangerousness of Karen Reed, you'll say, hmm, she's not likely to ever do this again. She's never, she's not a violent person. She's a 90 pound woman in her forties. Uh, she doesn't own a gun as far as a history of it. So, so she, there's not a, there's not a high dangerousness level. So I think it is more likely to get the jury to send a message by saying, if they find that there was something wrong with the investigation, I think it's a little bit more likely. So just something to think about. Um, I don't know what you, what you guys think on that. If you think it's, if that's something that you find accurate or, you know, no, also that's how that they, I was thinking about today was. Dude, that's how they determine bail. It's nothing to do with whether or not they'll convict her. They'll convict her based on whether or not they think she fucking did it. Not whether or not they think she'll do it again. That's, that's between bail and the sentencing. What happens in between is just determining whether or not she fucking did it. The fuck are you talking about? Like, do you fucking hear yourself, man? Do you hear yourself? I, I got to hear that one more time. Of Karen Reed, you'll say, hmm. She's not likely to ever do this again. She's never. She's not a violent person. She's a ninety-pound woman in her forties. Uh, she doesn't own a gun. As far as the history of it, so, so she there's not a there's not a high dangerous assault. So I think it is more likely to get the jury to send a message by saying if they find that there was something wrong with the investigation, I think it's a little bit more likely. So just something to think about. Um, I don't know what you what you guys think on that. If you think it's if that's something that you find accurate or no, you know, I also no. another thing that I was thinking about today was Judge Canone. I don't know if you guys found it interesting that Judge Canone limited. The prosecution and the defense essentially she started out by limiting him to 10 minutes. She gave him a little more than that. But they had been told that they would have all the time they wanted. And she had an explanation for that to Alan Jackson. But I don't know if, and watching that the second time, I'm not sure if that really? fully does it. To me, keep in mind something else that Judge Canone said. Okay. She read all of the federal documents, 3,000 or 3,100 pages. She read that and she understands the, the origination of the federal investigation. I where. don't know. I mean, technically, that could be deter that could be. Um, that could be perceived as as her saying that i could see how that could be uh you know um how somebody could take that that way that she read 3100 documents because she said yeah i read it all but she said i read it all when mentioned when when the 50 page document and his notes or whatever something else what she yeah there was a, a memo or something um so I'm not sure that Judge Bev meant. I, I guess it's 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 a matter of opinion, um, unless I'm hearing it wrong too. That's that's possible, very possible. But 3,100 pages, I don't think she read. Um, but I don't think she. I, I don't even think that she said that she read all of them. Uh, I could see how it could be interpreted that way, but I don't. I I, I feel like she was referring to what was supposed to be presented in court today. Right. The motions and the responses. Right. Where she said, I think that to me, the fact that she limited them to 10 minutes is a sign that she didn't see anything very compelling in that federal stash. If there was a lot of information uncovered by that federal investigation that tended to be a truly exculpatory. See, that's what makes me think that she didn't read it. <laughs> That's what, what makes me think that she didn't read it. Um, so, yeah. Uh, and and again, this is a very, very, this is a very, very major motion to file. Okay? This is not small potatoes. This is not your everyday, what you see in every trial motions. I mean, this is not a motion to continue. That's not what this is. This is a motion to dismiss and disqualify the district attorney's office from the case. This is 
a major, major deal. And see what I did there, Plevin? I muted, I burped, and I muted because I don't think anybody wanted to hear it. So it's 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 something that obviously the defense is going to have to be very careful and use kids' gloves in how they present it, and they better have proof. They better have data to back up what they're saying, right? So that's a big, big deal right there. Now, Judge Bev has to take time to consider everything, too. Judge Bev has to take time to consider everything before she makes a decision. This is why she didn't make a decision at the last hearing. She allowed them to present the motions. She is going to take the time to consider the motions before she rules on whether or not to dismiss and disqualify the Norfolk County District Attorney and the case against Karen Reed. Sorry. And it showed that there was possibly a cover-up. I don't think she would have limited him to 10 minutes. And she is known as a defense lawyer's, I'm sorry, a defense team's attorney. She's someone that, that is considered to be defense team's like. She's very sympathetic towards him. Yet she only gave them. Maybe that's why she was getting, maybe that's why she's harder on the defense in this case is because she's trying to shake that reputation. Again, maybe her motives are about image. Maybe her motives revolve around her image and preservation of it. That's something to absolutely consider, not just a possibility, but a likelihood based on her decision making throughout the two years of this case. Gave them 10 minutes. So to me, I think that that is an indication that there was no big convincing bombshell in, in the uh, federal stuff that was turned over. Now, as I've said, we can look at the things that weren't said, that apparently didn't uncover any communications to Michael Proctor that morning or that day that would be suspicious. And I think that's powerful, right? If there's going to be a conspiracy, someone has to tell him. Uh, I don't know. I assume he has, a, he has a police phone and a personal phone where they both checked. I mean, you know, I don't know about all that stuff. But the feds, the way they were digging into this, I have to assume that they did. They dug very deeply into his personal messages, and they seem to have found some embarrassing ones, right? So, but what they didn't find was any communication to Michael Proctor that day asking him for help. So I think that's pretty powerful. Now, the two big things that came out of that were supposedly the FBI are digging into this. I have to assume that they did. They dug very deeply into his personal messages and they said, I don't know, I assume he has a, he has a police phone and a personal phone or any communications to Michael Proctor that morning or that day that would be, Sorry. yet she only gave them 10 minutes. So to me, I think that that is an indication that there was no big convincing bombshell in, in the uh, federal stuff that was turned over. Now, as I've said, we can look at the things that weren't said that apparently didn't uncover any communications to Michael Proctor that morning or that day that would be suspicious. And I think that's powerful, right? If there's going to be a conspiracy, someone has to tell him. Uh, I don't know. I assume he has, a, he has a police phone and a personal phone where they both checked. I mean, you know, I don't know about all They just stuff. didn't mention it. They didn't mention it because it's not, it, it's not something that they're going to present yet. They had to pick and choose. As you said yourself, they only had 10 minutes. But it's almost as if he knows that that's the valid excuse against the, the argument that he's trying to make. He's like, well, they didn't mention any suspicious phone calls between Proctor and anybody else. But the fact is, is that Jennifer McCabe's phone records show that she spoke to Proctor early that morning, shortly after she spoke to 911. We know this for a fact. So, and regardless, we also know that Brian Albert and Brian Higgins spoke to each other at 2.22 a.m. just minutes before the the Jen McCabe search for how long to die in cold. I'm sorry, but I'm I, with everything else that we're seeing in this case, there's no way I'm going to look at that as a coincidence. At this point, there are no such thing as coincidences in this case. There just aren't. I'd be foolish. I'd be naive, foolish to think that there are coincidences. So regardless if there's, <laughs> I mean, well, I guess it's not regardless, but, but, you know, you're telling me that there's no suspicious phone calls taking place here, but, you know, 
even if it were even if it wasn't suspicious between if it, even if it wasn't suspicious that Proctor called Jennifer McCabe early that morning right after she spoke to 911 well even if that didn't happen it would still be suspicious that Higgins and Brian Albert spoke to each other it would absolutely be suspicious Especially when they said that they were supposed to, they, they, they said they were asleep. I mean, come on. That stuff. But the feds, the way they were digging into this, I have to assume that they did. They dug very deeply into his personal messages and they seem to have found some embarrassing ones, right? So, but what they didn't find was any communication to Michael Proctor that day asking him for help. So I think that's pretty powerful. Now, the two big things that came out of that were supposedly the FBI experts in Quantico found something about the 227 and also that they claimed they hired an independent expert who couldn't, ex who couldn't necessarily explain the accident reconstruction, John's injuries versus the damage to the SUV. Until we see those reports, it's very hard to comment on them because Alan Jackson... You see what Plevin did there? The words, very selective in what he's... He, here he is, right after he does something very good with words, talks about how Alan Jackson is very good with words. Uh, got something on your mind there, Plevin? Call <laughs> trying to take the attention away from yourself and on to Alan Jackson after what you just tried to pull there. Listen up real quick. Accident reconstruction, John's injuries versus the damage to the SUV. Until we see those reports, it's very hard to call the accident for an independent expert who couldn't, ex who couldn't necessarily explain the accident reconstruction, John's injuries versus the damage to the SUV. Okay. He words it like that. He says that this independent expert for the feds couldn't necessarily explain John's injuries coming from the SUV. That's not what happened. At least according to Alan Jackson. Alan Jackson said, which I would assume he'd be able to prove, said that there is no way that John's injuries are consistent with being hit with Karen's SUV. Based on an expert who has three PhDs that there's no way. Now, again, I would assume that Alan Jackson would be able to prove this. It's on him. He's the one who filed. This is the one occasion. This is the one circumstance so far in this case where it is on the defense. The burden of proof is on the defense. And that is because they are the ones who filed a motion for dismissal and a motion for disqualification because he's technically accusing people of misconduct, if not crimes. Thank you for becoming a member of State New York. Welcome to Logic. Thank you. So I don't see Alan Jackson. Because again, they, they they would have to. You're this is a a bad career move if you're just throwing words around. You would have to prove this. You're you're accusing a brother in the law of absolute misconduct, much much less possibly crimes, corruption. I think that everything that they plan on presenting that are in those federal findings are in those federal findings. And that's what they're laying their dismissal on. That's what right now they're leaning their entire defense for Karen Reed is on that federal investigation and whatever its findings are. Until we see those reports, it's very hard to comment on them because... Alan Jackson is a trickster with words, very selective in what he cites. Um, but Judge Canone would have read everything that was turned over. And I don't think there was... He had 10 minutes to recite, to choose what he was going to recite. Anything there that really blew her away. So this, you know, I would be shocked if this doesn't go to trial. This is going to trial. And that doesn't mean that all of those things couldn't be important. So those things, for instance, if, if the... If the feds did hire an independent expert that actually did conclude that they couldn't explain the injuries that could be more than enough to create reasonable doubt that's not what he said though 
See, you're assuming that that's what the federal findings say. You're wording it like that. You're being a trickster with words, or at least attempting to be, but you're failing because I'm calling you out on it. You're saying, well, the federal findings is that they could not conclude. They, they, they had trouble concluding and, and connecting the injuries with, no, 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 no. That's not what Alan Jackson said. And the only thing that we know that the only, the only indication of what these federal findings say is what Alan Jackson presented to the court. That's it. That's all we know. We have to go by Alan Jackson's word. And what he said was very different. What he said was that the this expert determined that there's no way that John O'Keefe's injuries are consistent with Karen hitting him with the SUV. Couldn't have happened. So that's very different than uh, I had trouble being able to connect the dots there. No, dude. Like, stop it. Nice try, though, but stop it because that's not what it says. <laughs> um, I, I mean, maybe, but you have no way of knowing that. So who's being a trickster with words here? You, you can't accuse Alan Jackson of being a trickster with words when you don't know what it says. Your own argument works against you. You're saying there's no way to know what that 31 doc, 3100 doc, page document says. You just said there's no way to know. Yet here you are saying, well, Alan Jackson is being a trickster with words. How do you know that if you don't know what's in the document? I mean, Plavin, bro. No, but I mean, we have to see that, we, you know, Again, Alan Jackson is very, very clever with his words. Like when he said non-human hair, there was no non-human hair and there never was. And that was just designed to trick people. And that's not going to trick Judge Cano. And that's not that's not going to trick a jury either because he won't even try those things with a jury for the most part because the prosecution is just going to turn around and explain it. So same thing with the library gap. There was no gap in the library video. Those no, 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 no. See, again, you don't seem to understand how court works. See, again, for you in the back, Plevin, um, no, the prosecution is going to have to present their case and then the defense is going to shoot down what the prosecution has because the prosecution has no solid evidence. The defense already, I could I could point out the holes. I can already point out the holes in the process in the prosecution's evidence against Karen Reed. I can already do that. So you're sitting here and you're saying, well, the defense is going to present this to the jury and then the prosecution is going to shoot it down. No, what's going to happen is if this goes to trial, the prosecution is going to present their case and the defense is going to shoot that down. That's what's going to happen. Right now, they're just trying to. I mean, you don't know if 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 Judge Canone fails to dismiss this case. If she chooses not to dismiss it and it does go to trial, there's probably going to be a motion filed from the prosecution that everything gets sealed, that everything leading up to this, all of these motions that were filed end up getting sealed and the jury never knows about them. The jury never knows. If the judge makes this decision, then it's possible, I would think, in theory, I'm not a lawyer, but I would think in theory that the prosecution can file a motion saying, since you ruled against this dismissal and disqualification, anything they used as an argument to do that should be sealed, Your Honor. So if they were to do that, then they would have no choice but to simply poke holes in the prosecution's case, in the prosecution's so-called evidence. So, explosion. Yeah, there's a motion to get camped. So, just nothing got picked up because she didn't drive by. So, but he's very tricky with the ways that he's going to word things. And so, we don't know here is was. Did the feds actually find something? Did their independent investigator accident reconstruction is fine? That that they couldn't explain the injuries and the damage? That'd be powerful if they did. 
But at this early state, I think state, I think we have to be really cautious about that. So uh, let me get to the comments. And again, happy St. Patrick's Day. For those of you guys over at Twitter, if you can pop over here into we YouTube and just click subscribe, I would really appreciate it. Click like. Cautious um, of it any. seems like most of the comments are from YouTube. So I think Twitter people are a different breed. They don't, they're not, they're a little more standoffish, but there's a lot more people watching from Twitter. So if you could just click, come over here and give us a shout out, give us a, give us a like, you don't have to say hi if you don't want, but it'd obviously be great if you do. So appreciate it. And we'll just get to the comments. I'll go back. Let's, what should I go back to? Let's go back to uh, 857. Let's see if we got a question here. So Shannon says, I heard Yanetti brought his sister. Yeah. I mean, as she's a lawyer. Must he? He kind of said as much, John Sanford. I'm of the opinion that you're. You're. I, I'm inclined to, to agree with you. I'm inclined to agree with you because you're saying the feds will sweep in before first gavel drops in this case. Levy already said as much. Now, uh, I'm inclined to agree with you in the sense that yes, the feds will most likely do so. And I think, in so many words, Levy pretty much said as much. Like, in good conscience, cannot allow this trial to go on. Um, we heard that. We heard those words. So I'm thinking that probably this little move of them investigating uh, Proctor internally is probably the first. It's just a sign. It's an indication that there was word of mouth that the feds are about to move in. I think indictments are coming down. I think that the feds are absolutely planning at some point to basically just step in and be like, okay, this is enough is enough. This has gone too far. And if it gets to that point, judge Bev is more than likely looking at some sort of reprimand here. If the feds have to actually step in and stop this trial from taking place, there's a there, judge Bev is looking at something. Uh, thank you, never, uh, never fear truth for becoming a YouTube member. I appreciate you. Welcome, uh, Scott McGinnis. Thank you, buddy. Uh, Karen Reed defense team is going for the bad guys. Agreed, agreed. Thank you. We must just get her, it doesn't really mean anything to me. Just got to get her some experience. Someone has said that maybe Alan Jackson hasn't been paid for it to appear in the trial. I'd be surprised if he doesn't, though. Yeah, it's not gonna work. Like, they're, they're, they're trying to get they're trying to have Proctor fall on his sword without having him fall on his sword. That's what's going on here. Nothing to see here. We're taking care of it. Don't worry. But yet he's still on active duty. So get the fuck out of my face with that. Like there's, you know, it's saying, oh, well, yeah, we don't think that he did anything wrong. So we're going to make it appear that he actually didn't do anything wrong, but we're still taking it seriously. That's that's the action that is supposed to tell the that that's 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 the message that's being sent to the public through this action. Is nothing to see here. We're handling it, but we're handling it. Kyle V, thank you so much. Wow. Gift to 10 memberships. Holy cow. Thank you so much, buddy. I appreciate it. Um, yellow clout fails. Ah. <laughs> Why can't I see the gifted memberships? Why are they not showing up? Here we go. Okay. Magnolia Gypsy, 13 Kings, Cat L, Bookworm, Guppy Guy. Kate Blair, Ticha, Island Girl, Donovan, Anonymous. All right, congrats. Welcome, guys. Is that it? I don't know. This is coming through like weird. Oh, and Kyle V just became a member as well. Welcome to Logic, buddy. I appreciate it. All right. Um, which says the thing is, if there's not enough evidence, then you have to get an innocent. Yeah, but what I was talking about was a different scenario where there is enough evidence, but the investigation was so flawed that you start to question things, um, the validity of the evidence, maybe. Uh, and that's it. Look, that's kind of like right there. Where it was pretty. He said it. He said it. It's the validity of the evidence. All of it is flawed. All of it. 
simply due to the pro to the to the conflict of interest from the investigators and the fact that this was absolutely already admitted to to the grand jury there's absolutely a conflict of interest that's taking place here and that means that any evidence con c collected by these investigators that are involved in this conflict of interest is tainted it doesn't work it's no longer valid. There's no validity to this evidence anymore. Plevin, you just said so yourself. There's no validity to it anymore. It's done. Pretty, I think there was more than enough evidence to convict OJ, but there seemed to be some misconduct on the part of the cops, maybe even some planting of evidence. So um, the jury was forced to acquit because of that. Frank Perry says we have to understand we can always look through the microscope and find some kind of connection somewhere in, uh, somewhere, somehow in every case ever. Yeah, I mean, I think there's, there's enough here to be troubled by it, but there's not enough to be troubled when you look at the basic evidence. So for me, if this was a case where, where um, somebody connected to the Alberts had a speeding ticket fixed, I would say, okay, that's the kind of connection it was. Um, but the kind of connection to get someone to go and plant evidence, not even close. And even if there was some secret motive that we, that we could never understand, there was just no opportunity to plant evidence. There was no opportunity to tamper with that vehicle. Stephen Fenner says, when Judge Canone said she read all 3,100 pages, I looked away from what I was doing to the TV screen to think to help myself in my head bullshit. Oh, why, why wouldn't you believe that? Because if I, I'm not even the judge. And if somebody gave me that stash of evidence, I would have read every page. You know, because you got a lot of that stuff you can skim through if it's repetitive and things like that too. But I, I would have read every page. That's I get. I'm a document guy. I love getting these documents. And so when something comes out, like the one on Delphi I did this week, you know, I read every word. Uh, Jewel said, "I don't." Hopefully, David Banner says when Judge can have no opportunity to tamper with that. We than it was, um, but the kind of connection to get someone to go and plant evidence, not even close. And even if there was some secret motive that we that we could never understand, there was just no opportunity to plant evidence. There was no opportunity to tamper with that vehicle. What do you mean there was no opportunity to plant evidence or tamper with the vehicle? First of all, they took the vehicle to a police station that was way out of the way, that it never, ever, ever made sense as to why they would tow that truck, tow that vehicle to where they towed it from, the, from, from where they towed it from. It didn't make any sense. Then on top of that, right, you're going to say that there's no... There's no opportunity for Proctor to plant the evidence. There's nothing but opportunity to plant evidence when the findings of the evidence and the searches for the evidence are undocumented. That means that it's totally legit. It's a blank page. There is no time limit as to what opportunity Proctor had to plant the evidence if it was undocumented that means that it's so broad it could have been at any time that's why that evidence is no longer valid besides the the fact that his credibility is shot due to the conflict of interest besides that proctor absolutely had plenty of opportunity as well as motive due to the conflict of interest as well as motive to plant that evidence that is something that you cannot deny at all if he found those pieces of taillight even one piece of that taillight and it was undocumented that is enough to create doubt that is enough to doubt that evidence five undocumented searches though Woo! Mm -mm 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 -mm. That evidence is no good. Stephen Fenner says, when Judge Canone said she read all 3,100 pages, I looked away from what I was doing to the TV screen to think to help myself in my head, bullshit. Oh, why, why wouldn't you believe that? Yeah, Because if I, I'm not even the judge. And if somebody gave me that stash of evidence, I would have read every page. You know, because you got to... Not in a week's time when you have other cases that you're residing over. 
You think that's the only case that Judge Bev is ta- is is dealing with right now? A lot of that stuff you can skim through if it's repetitive and things like that too. But I, I would have read every page. That's I get. I'm a document guy. I love getting these documents. And so when something comes out like the one on Delphi oh, did this God, week, you dude. know, I read every word. I, I, uh, Jules says, I don't, "Hopefully, this is the real I, Jules." I'm, I'm a document I'll be joining guy. you on a live event. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. All right, you're welcome anytime. And Shut up! Uh, I was. Oh my God! I don't care. I felt bad about what happened a couple of shows ago, but uh, we connected right afterwards. And but that was why I felt bad because I like Jules and I, I thought she liked me, and then I was like hurt. But it was someone that came on as a fake Jules. So you know what, Jules, you've reached a different level in this thing when people start faking you. I've got fake people on Twitter, and uh, one I complained about. And Twitter refused to remove them for me. So I had to complain again and say, I'm going to have to bring out my attorneys because they're clearly trying to be me and they're putting out disinformation. It's very, it's very troubling. Sean McDonough says Biden's a rat. Is Biden now connected to this case too? Did, uh, we know, we know they're saying it's Soros. <laughs> oh my God. And Julie defended us by saying quality over quantity. Yep, exactly. And that's I what mean, we pride ourselves see, that's, in here. Is that's, that another reason why, that's another reason why the Soros thing is just a bad idea, man. Because you start fucking throwing that, that shit around. You know, you start throwing that shit around and it just fuels these assholes like Plevin over here to, to gaslight everybody and make everybody sound crazy. You start throwing that bullshit around, and then you got this dickhead who's just going to be like, oh, well, no, they fucking think that Soros did it. You know, Biden's behind it. Blah, blah, blah. I, yeah. So. Kane and Guy, and you guys aren't here, but you're still here, despite that, right? Because you're here, we just like an honest discussion of the case. And I think that's important to everybody that's on this channel. And though that's not important, To some people, some of these, some of these are funny. So let's put them back up. I love this one. Uh, Wistachek says, is Jackson leaving after pretrial? I mean, I, I'm hearing that discussion, but I would be shocked unless Karen has run out of money. Um, Alan Jackson is a high priced lawyer, but you know, I would be shocked. And if me, if he's leaving, it has nothing to do with anything but money. Yeah, James no. is talking about Aiden Kearney. Please, he's up on the caps. Ames, uh, James says Aiden Kearney. Right? I don't, I don't see Yanetti or Jackson leaving this case for any other reason other than money. Uh, and I'm not saying that they're just doing it for the money. I mean, uh, I've seen cases where, and I, I mean, who knows? Like, I, I, I wouldn't blame them. I wouldn't hold it against them. If, I mean. A defense like this costs money. So if they can't properly defend their client because there's no more money, well, then they can't properly defend their client. So I'm not going to be like, oh, well, why aren't they doing it pro bono? That means money's going to come out of their pocket to prob- to properly defend Karen Reed against this case. So, uh, but I don't think the money's going to run out because people are donating. Um, and so it's, it's, people believe in Karen Reed, man. Uh so, uh, you know, they believe in, in Yanetti and Jackson. They want uh, them to go through. So, that yeah, I don't see them uh, jumping ship here at any point. He ratting out his co-conspirators. Yeah, he's got, I don't see him turning on Karen. She, from what we're seeing, has tuned him out. And I'm sure it stings. But he's, and he's built his whole empire on this. So he can't afford, he still asks um, his audience to call him daddy. I, I also don't have an opinion uh, or I don't share the opinion that, that Karen Reed has tuned Turtle Boy out. I don't believe that that's the case. We haven't seen Jackson and Yanetti either talk to any press lately, have we? Um, it just might very well be that since, and, and, and I don't think it's a coincidence that it's happened since the FBI investigation became public so once that happened we haven't seen any uh interviews uh, or press addresses from uh yanetti or jackson or karen reed uh so i don't think that there's any reason that's just my personal opinion i don't think there's any reason for turtle boy to take it personally that karen reed has not contacted him or spoken to him uh because i don't i just don't think that I think it's a 
it's a defensive strategy at this point to not speak to the press. There is an open FBI federal investigation, and it's probably under the FBI's uh, suggestion, under their guidance to and request to not speak to the press. I would assume so. Uh, federal investigations are usually kept pretty tight lip. So the fact that we're even aware of it happening is one big deal in, in and of itself. So I would assume uh, that Josh Levy is probably advising Karen Reed's defense as well as Karen Reed to not speak to the press or to speak as little as possible publicly. Um, so if I were Turtle Boy, I wouldn't take it personally. I would assume that that's the case. Um, you know. Which is disgusting and telling. But how can Daddy be wrong, right? How could Daddy be so wrong about this for all this time? So trust me, Turtle Boy knows Karen is guilty. He has information that, that he can't discuss and I can't discuss. Hi, Fiona. You always jump in late. I know who put Murd 2 on the table, usually overcharged. Uh, oh, I think it's a question. Who put murder two on the table? Yeah, we got to find out that information. That's um, a good. That's a good point, Super Max Captain. Super Max Captain. That's a good point. You're saying, Will, it seems like Jackson and his team have all been tight-lipped. They know this case is a winner, and that the skeletons are being forced out of the closet. I agree with you. I think it's an absolute, uh, absolutely strategic. Uh, it, it makes perfect sense in theory that they would remain tight-lipped for now because it also sends the message that we don't have to say anything now. The truth is going to speak for itself. All we're doing now at this point is presenting the truth where it matters, which is inside of a courtroom. And sending that message speaks volumes, especially to the public. It speaks volumes, sending that message in a subtle way, yet very direct at the same time. The truth is all we need to, to speak for us. We don't need to sell the truth. The truth sells itself. This is what it is. We have proof. We have an FBI investigation that is open, and these things are going to come to light, and we don't need to sell it. We just need to sell it in the courtroom, period. Let our evidence and our presentation of that evidence and under the right circumstances speak for itself. And I think it's a hell of a powerful message to send. And it's working. Hopefully it's not just based on the fact that they were having a vicious argument. I mean, because that's ridiculous because all couples, all, all, uh, most couples do that, right? If, especially if they're out drinking, that can happen from time to time. So that should not, in any way, hopefully there's other evidence that they've looked at here. And I suspect they found some things, I suspect, I, you know, I have no inside information on this, that they found some things that would indicate consciousness of guilt. For example, uh, if she turned off her GPS at some strange time, such as between one and five, that would be, that would be a strong indicator of consciousness of guilt. Uh, also, if she deleted the ring video, we don't know why, but it would be strange and it would be evidence of that. And we don't know what's in her messages, right? That's never been revealed. Um, we know there's a lot of messages between her and Brian Higgins. Now, all of that may just be to show that they were having an affair. But is there, were there any messages that morning after she got home? That would be really interesting. Uh, Frank Perry says, Kevin, would you not believe that if the feds have this mystery evidence that torpedoes the whole case, the defense? That would be interesting because it would also implicate Brian Higgins because they would definitely be using that as probable cause. If Brian Higgins is stating we would know about that. If we know about everything else, we would know if there was communication between Karen Reed and Brian Higgins that was nefarious after the fact. Brian Higgins would be testifying against Karen Reed. He would be a major witness. And the defense would know about it because the defense would have to be able to prepare for it. This would have to be in discovery for the defense to be able to fairly defend against this. So Plevin doesn't know how the law works at all. Not even on TV. Like, 
the CSI effect is over his head, which is fascinating. <laughs> Would not be standing on a pulpit yelling she is innocent. All right, let's try to dissect. We know Frank's a serious guy, and he wants good. He wants solid discussion. So let's see what he means by this. Frank says, "Kevin, would you not believe that if the feds have this mystery evidence that torpedoes the whole case?" Oh yes, one hundred percent. I one hundred percent agree with you, Frank. And this is what I said weeks ago. I said this in the day. I said this, but leading up to once they get the federal information, if they don't have a press conference that night saying we demand the drops, the, the charges be dropped, then that means there's no real smoking gun thing in there, because they don't have to get out there and say anything specific. They can just get out there and says we now have it. That's it. The sham, stop the sham, stop the charade. It's over. They never did that. And they were silent on it the whole time. And then when they got into court, nothing explosive. They started out talking about uh, a story with Officer Link supposedly helping Chris Albert in a fight 20 years ago or 25 years ago or something like that at a bar. I mean, it was absurd. So, no, there was no smoking gun evidence. What that does, Plevin. See, I love that. I love that little strategy. He's trying to, like, use misdirection and, and he's trying to reverse uh the the importance of what that is he's trying to say oh well that shit was like 20 something years ago that's plevin's logic here what he's trying to bring up something that happened like 20 years ago no the point plevin is that lank and proctor or sorry lank and chris or yeah chris albert go back 20 years that Sergeant Lank and someone who sits on the Canton Select Board, who's the brother of 34, uh, the brother of the owner of 34 Fairview, they go back 20 years. That's the point. Not that, oh my God, that was 20 years ago. No. Yeah. That was 20 years ago. That's how far back they go. That is clearly a conflict of interest. Lank was the only law enforcement allowed in the house. Right. Of course, but that's not suspicious at all. These are things that he's failing to mention or even address. James Clay says 31 pages, no indictments. Yep, good point. I mean, not only, not only 31, 3,100 pages, but according to the recent document, uh, I think I forget if it was Cianetti or Lally that said it, uh, the federal investigation began in November of 20. Even if there are no indictments, which I believe there will be, but even if there are no indictments, there is already enough evidence to indicate why you should absolutely dismiss these charges against Karen Reed because you cannot get a conviction on the evidence that they have. You cannot convict Karen Reed on the evidence that they have. It can't be done. There is too much doubt. Way too much. So, this is <laughs> hilarious to me that this guy is even, I mean. Of 2022. Now, I have indications that it began in August of 2022. Too. I've seen the messages. Can you guys hear Clever snoring? Yeah, Twitter he, allows uh, fake accounts, yes, and it does not say power. He's just the cutest damn thing, man. I love him so much. Say parody in the name. And I pointed that out. Uh, Lauper, Lauper. Lauper says, if the defense has clear evidence that the feds found to derail the state's case, you'd know about it. Yeah, absolutely. And I find it unusual that the feds have told the, or at least. I mean, that's the thing is, is I think the indictments are coming. And to sit here and say, well, the indictments aren't going to happen. They would have happened already. No, you don't know how federal investigation works. You don't know how long it's going to take them to collect enough evidence to where they feel it's going to be enough. They have to determine. The U.S. attorney will determine when it, there is enough evidence that they can use to convince a jury beyond a reasonable doubt that there is misconduct as well as corruption here. 
when they feel like there will be an indictment against Michael Morrissey when they feel that they have collected enough evidence to present to a jury that will ensure a conviction beyond a reasonable doubt. Especially if what they're accusing him of is trying to convict somebody without any evidence. See what I'm saying? Like, it's going to be a real bad look if they walk into a federal courtroom and try to convict a, a district attorney of trying to convict, trying to convict someone without sufficient evidence. So, I mean, you, you're going to have to bring your A game. Levy's going to have to be able to be ready for that. So they're going to take their time. They're going to make sure this gets done right. And Michael Morrissey's not going anywhere. All he's doing is operating and giving them more evidence. <laughs> that's all he's doing right now. Everything that's going on with Turtle Boy, all this shit is all a bad look on Morrissey. I mean, you look at Lolly, he's a joke. You look at Mello, he's even more of a joke. This is absolute and utter bullshit. Everything that they're doing. And the more that they do it, the bigger of a case, the more tighter of a case that Josh Levy is going to have against Michael Morrissey and anybody working under him that can be implicated. At least according to today, they say that the case is continuing. The investigation is continuing. At this point, they know that they're jeopardizing the state's murder trial by doing that. So this is just one of many signs that what the feds doing are doing is corrupt. You know, Howie Carr had an article that was very critical. Uh, it was, and I've read Howie Carr's articles for years, and I, you know, I, I, was always... I, I, I love it again with the corruption. So this is this is Plevin's out. All Plevin gives a fuck about is being relevant on Twitter. That's all he gives a fuck about. Because all he does is just blast nonsense all over fucking Twitter. So all he's looking for is to be able to, once once Karen Reed is found innocent or these charges are dismissed, he'll still get to say, well, it's because. Because he'll either get to say, see, I told you so. Karen Reed is guilty. Or he'll get to say, see, I told you so. Karen Reed was guilty but found innocent or the case was dismissed because of federal corruption. But he's just looking for his foolproof way. of He's setting himself up for some sort of imaginary foolproof way of getting to say, I told you so on Twitter. That's what he's doing. That is how pathetic this is. His entire, this is all a setup so he could in some way, shape, or form get to post on Twitter, I told you so. Mark my words. I was always a fan of his work on the, for the Herald. And I haven't seen him so much recently, but I used to like his show back in the day um, because he was covering things that no one else would cover in this state. But that last article really left me wanting and it was weak in logic. So he says that, um, I'm, I'm paraphrasing here, but he said something to the effect that how ironic that the corrupt state as investigation is being uncovered by the most corrupt people of all, the feds, the, Fed, the FBI. But he doesn't stop to say, all right, but if the FBI is the most corrupt agency of all, then how do you trust what they're uncovering here? So, and again, and I'm not trying to knock the many, you know, I'm not trying to, to criticize the, the many thousands of good men and women who made a career for the FBI, who work for the FBI now, who are trying to do good things and are dedicated to, to doing things the right way. But there is historically been a lot of corruption, certainly a lot in recent years, especially it seems to me the closer you get to Washington, Plevin. Let's talk about that for a second. Okay. Now I'm not getting political here. I'm just, this is just to respond to what Plevin is saying here. Cause Plevin's excuse is like, okay, well, how can you on one side of your mouth say that the FBI is corrupt because they're trying to railroad Trump. Right. But, and then, and then, and then count on the FBI to run a, a, an investigation that isn't corrupt and trust them to run this investigation uh, on the up and up. Well, it's interesting. <laughs> it's interesting because, I mean, 
if the FBI, why would the FBI, why would the, the FBI, or at least why would U.S. Attorney Levy try to railroad, I mean, or support an agency and work with an agency that's trying to railroad Trump, yet try to take down corruption in a blue state. I mean, I'm just spitballing here. I don't fucking know. You know what I'm saying? But it, it, it seems weird that he would bring this up because that would tell me that Josh Levy's on the up and up. It would tell me that he's not corrupt. It would tell me that he's not driven by the political agenda that the FBI is being criticized for. The political agenda that the FBI is being criticized for is that they work for Biden and the Biden administration, and they are out to railroad uh, the the district attorney who represents the blue Commonwealth of Massachusetts. It's it's weird that you would think that. I mean, uh, yeah, I, I just don't see. Uh, I see Josh Levy definitely having political aspirations, but if I'm if I got political aspirations, then I'm gonna take down corruption. That's gonna look good. You know what I'm saying? That's gonna look good when I run for office in the future. You know what I'm saying? So, I mean. Is that corruption? No, it's opportunity. If you see corruption and you can prove it and you can go after it and take it down and that looks good on a resume and that looks good on a candidacy moving forward somewhere, then fuck yeah, you do it. Let's let's not let's not sit here and pretend like Anybody involved in this case and what they're doing is it in some way, shape, or form self-serving. Of course, Jackson and Yanetti, they get something out of this. They get paid for their services, of course, but they also get high profile. And it sure as hell looks good on them if they got an innocent woman who's being framed. If they got her off of those charges and put the people who should be accountable put them in a position to be held accountable. That's a damn good look for J Jackson and Yanetti moving forward. That's a damn good career move. Josh Levy, damn good career move if he takes down corruption. So, I mean, sure. But it doesn't mean that it's not the right thing to do. You know what I'm saying? Just because somebody does something that's self-serving doesn't mean that it's not the right thing to do. Right? Now, do I think that Turtle Boy's reasons for taking on the Karen Reed case are self-serving? No, I do not. But I also don't think that it's an indication necessarily that it's self-serving because he makes money off of free Karen Reed t-shirts. Why shouldn't he be able to support himself through his efforts. That's like saying Jackson and Yanetti shouldn't be making any money off of this because defending Karen Reed would be the right thing to do. Yes, of course. But that doesn't that doesn't imply corruption. You know what I mean? Like just because you are benefiting in some way from doing the right thing besides, you know, having a warm, fuzzy feeling inside, that does not mean that you are corrupt. But when you're lying and trying to fuck other people over and cheat people out of their basic rights after you've taken an oath and colluding with other people to in order to do this, well then, yes, that is is corruption, my friends. So, no. You know, I mean, you could sit here and shit all over Turtle Boy all day because he makes money off t-shirts and he makes money off his channel. 
I mean, this is what I've said. I've said myself, dude, I feel so grateful. So grateful because I feel really good about this. Because no matter what happens is I could be talking about a case that nobody is really paying attention to. Man, I had maybe 100 people watching when I was streaming the Gannon Stouk uh, trial, the Letitia Stouk trial. I had maybe 100 people watching each day, and I streamed it every single day because I was dying for this to happen. I followed that case since the day that boy went missing. And I was extremely passionate about it. And a lot of that time, I wasn't even monetized. But I stuck with it because I, I I was passionate about it. But this is the first time that I've done well with the channel and been this passionate about a case. I only get involved with cases that I am passionate about. Now, I may not be that passionate about it at first when I look into it. When I first look into it, I'm just interested. But I only go this I only go this hard on a case if I am absolutely passionate about it. And no, what I've benefited from this case is not what's made me passionate about it. What's made me passionate about it is seeing clear, clear evidence that something is absolutely fucking wrong. And I'm glued to it because I, I need to see things change for the better. I need to see some, I need to see justice served. I am, I am fixated on this. I need to see justice served. I'm, this is the craziest shit I've ever seen on YouTube in true crime anywhere. I've never seen anything like this. Never followed a case this crazy. So, yes, I feel blessed that I can make a living doing something that I love and care about and I am passionate about. Well, not necessarily make a living, but make, you know, make some support, benefit, monetarily is the best way to put it, from something that I feel passionate about. That's why I won't call it work. So it's not just because you're benefiting from doing the right thing. It does not make you corrupt. So to call me a grifter or to call turtle boy a grifter it, it it's not it doesn't it doesn't gel it doesn't gel hell you have this guy this nick Fiorolio, or however you say his name he's the only reason you don't see him blasting my chat with super chats now is because cherry hit him months ago Cherry hit him months ago from my chat for blasting Super Chats because I couldn't get on with my show. Look at how many times he he donated to Turtle Boy with a bunch of this George Soros nonsense. It's disturbing. It's, un, it's, it's not normal behavior. And I trust Cherry. And she knows why I do this. She knows it's not the money because she never would have hit him from my channel. She saw that he was getting overwhelming and manipulating the super chat thing because apparently money was no object to him. But to spew out nonsense every single time he super chatted, forcing me to acknowledge every super chat and stop my show and read it and then go, I, uh, I, I don't know, man, because I didn't know what the fuck he was talking about. But if I was doing this for the money, I'd be like, fuck the show. This dude's just fucking dropping. He's making it rain. But fuck that. Like, if I can't talk about, like, what's the point? You know what I mean? Like, what is the fucking point if I can't sit up here and share my thoughts with you?
So, I mean, yeah, it, it's, you know, the, there are people who benefit from certain things because they cut corners and they lie uh, and they, and they spin narratives and, you know, that's not something that I, I I'm okay with. Um, but, you know, um, Rich, thank you, buddy. Go cards. Yes. Washington, where the really ambitious people are, or the people that want to get to Washington, which may include Josh Levy, who gave up. I, I would agree with that. And one of the most highly esteemed and loved. I would agree with that. I would I would say that Josh Levy most likely, realistically, has political aspirations in the future. And taking down corruptions is a damn good look when it comes to that. The largest law firms in the world, Robeson Gray, and he gave that up to take this little job for the U.S. attorney. Why would you do that? You must have higher. No, he, the first job that he took was to be first U.S. attorney, which is right under the U.S. attorney. And then Rachel Rollins, the new U.S. attorney appointed by Biden, was pushed out because of corruption. So he moved right in. Um, but what's his ambition? Does he want to be a judge? Does he want to be attorney general in Washington? The only reason he gives up that partnership. In so his... why is he targeting a blue state if he's if he's corrupt? Why is he targeting a blue state? If he's corrupt and he's trying to railroad Trump, why is he why is he going after a blue state if he's corrupt? Makes no sense, man. Makes no sense. Again, if this dude has political aspirations, I mean, again, there's nothing wrong with benefiting yourself from doing the right thing. If Josh Levy's job is to get justice because he works alongside the Department of Justice and he works for the U.S. Attorney's Office, well then, yeah, I would expect him to get justice. That's He's doing his job. He's doing what my taxes are going towards. And this very elite law firm is for some higher ambition. His ambition was not to just go in and do some public duty. He had worked in the prosecutor's office when he was out of law school. So it's not like he'd never done it before. But to do this at this late stage in his career, no, this was the, that was, he's got some ambition on his mind. Now, whether that fed into why he's done what he did here or whether there was some personal connection between Josh Levy and David Dinetti or Karen Reed, you know, that remains to be determined. But there's a lot of things in this investigation that look shady right now. And especially when you see how hard they dug into this, how determined they were to find something and they didn't find anything. So it's, it's disturbing. Uh, Lori, thank you very much for the contribution. I appreciate it. Um, I try to read everybody's comment, but certainly since you donated, please feel free to say something so we can, uh, well, let's put, this, let's put that up on there as a way of showing gratitude. But thank you. I appreciate it. So, I mean, you can see in chat, we have a good group here. These are people that are, uh, you know, smart and friendly and trying to be fair about this, very civilized. And so just, again, people listening on Twitter, there's right now, there's, there's uh, 287. Again, this, we don't have any way the numbers of these other groups, but come over here and join us in on YouTube so you can actually see the comments because I don't think you can see them over there. Most of the comments are from YouTube. You big dummy. Hillbilly Nitro points out, he says, I suspect Karen Reed's phone activity when sh uh, she arrived home. Yeah, that'd be really, we haven't heard anything about her phone activity. It took a long time Boy, for to get that cunt. because not only did they have to, That's uh, she didn't give them their passwords, no, my understanding, but also very there's important. There's no relevant um, phone activity. She had bro. contacted. That's why we haven't heard shit about the phone activities because there's nothing relevant on it. Nothing at all. Fucking ridiculous. Unetti early on. And so you had messages that were attorney client privilege and they had, there were conditions that had to be agreed on in order to separate that stuff. And as a taint team. So taint um, team. at nine Oh seven, Steve said, Kevin, that isn't how it legally works, but I'm not sure what he's talking about. So hopefully I'll get caught up to it. So Wish says people can blame turtle and everyone else they want. And I don't care for him, but it's the followers who are the real problem. Yeah. It's the zombie horde. It's people that don't ask questions. People that can listen to someone say something like Sean saying on his show that Julie Nagel called. Dude, all I do is ask questions, bro. All I do is ask questions. Hell, earlier tonight, I even explored the question of whether or not Turtle Boy is an informant for the Commonwealth, which is why he got out of jail at the time that he did. No, simple common sense applied. It took took two minutes to apply simple common sense as to why there's just no way that Turtle Boy is an informant for the Commonwealth. 
There's no way. There's nothing to gain from it. There's nothing to gain from it. Like, he is flushing money down the toilet on Bradle if he's an informant for the Commonwealth. Plevin doesn't even believe that he's an informant for the Commonwealth. Like, of course. Of course, those of us with common sense are asking questions. The only reason, this is what's really funny, again, with the projection with this guy. The only reason that any of us are here right now hashtagging free Karen Reed, hashtagging justice for John O'Keefe, hashtagging free turtle boy. The only reason any of us are here right now doing that is because we asked questions. There is no fucking way on earth that I am ever going to just simply take turtle boy's word for something hell it, it's really funny that he could say that and put me lump me up with all of that as the grifter when i actually live streamed all of my exploration of this case 95 percent of everything that i know about this case was explored live here with you watching you guys were all witness to it in real time. All of it. So. And how did I come about knowing these things that I know about this case? I asked questions. The entire time, every single bit of opinion that I have on this case is a result of me asking questions. Everyone here in this chat who shares insight, they have accumulated this insight as a result of asking questions. It's very simple. And it's insulting to call these people a horde and, and say that they're just a zombie, they're brainless zombies. No. If you, who's the brainless zombies if, all you do is spew out nonsense and mistruths all over Twitter. Who's the brainless zombie if if all you can do is make up lies and then throw personal attacks at people without the, you're you're the people not asking questions. All you're doing is criticizing those of us who are asking questions and calling us conspiracy theorists because we're asking questions. You're criticizing us for asking questions by accusing us that we're not asking questions. It's the most bizarre thing I've ever seen. It's It, it would be slick if it wasn't so fucking absurd. But it's a good thing that we ask questions and have common sense because we can see right through it. It's the same tactic that Lolly's been using and used at, at this at this last hearing. It's the same tactic. That's what I find interesting. Lolly's tactic was exactly the same tactic that Twattendoffer tried to use in the video that I did earlier tonight. Is it not? If I say something out loud, it's the same thing Plevin's doing here. If if I say something. Enough times and loud enough, I guess it'll make it true. That's the tactic. That's the strategy. I just beat the idea into your head enough and then you'll start to believe it. But that's just assuming that we're stupid and we don't ask questions, isn't it? Because if we ask questions, that's not going to happen. We're impervious to that sort of manipulation. Because that... That, that manipulation is, is ridiculous. And it's insulting to think that anybody who's capable of critical thinking could be susceptible to that type of manipulation. It's absurd. Can't be done. So, best of luck. 
<laughs> in your venture, Plevin, Twat, and Doffer. Best of luck. Anyways, guys, I'm going to go ahead and wrap this up. Thank you guys for everything. Thanks for staying up so late with me. I hope you guys had a great St. Patrick's Day weekend. I love you guys very much. You guys are absolutely fantastic. All of the support that you guys have shown. Uh, those of you who have subscribed, uh, who are new subscribers, those of you who are watching on Twitter, uh, those of you who have come on over here and hit the like, I appreciate that. I love you guys very much, and we will do this again very soon, my friends.